Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Okay, good evening. This is Town of New Canaan Affordable Housing Committee. Regular meeting, Monday, April 15, 2024. Um, I'll start with a roll call. John Goodwin, I'm here. Chris Wilson. Here. Uh, Krista Nielsen. Here. I don't see Bill Perrette. Uh, hopefully he joins us soon. Mike Sweeney. Here. Maria Weingarten. Here. Jane Williams. Here. Jeff Williams. Present. Hillary Orman. Here. Great. Um, before I get going, um, I, I'd like to uh, talk about my friend, Gene Grislecki, who um, probably most of you know, um, passed away a couple of weeks ago. And it was nice to see that the Board of Selectmen honored her memory. Um, I think David Rucci of Planning and Zoning had some very kind remarks. And I, I just wanted to um, make a few remarks because I was lucky enough to serve with Jane on planning and zoning. And for those of you who did not know Jane, um, she was the epitome of service in general, but particularly in New Canaan. Um, she was just amazing. She, uh, I think, spent almost every day of the week at some point in the New Canaan planning and zoning office. Um, she was a mentor to the, plan to the planners. Um, she was, uh, she, she took the downtown New Canaan in particular, for those of you, for example, dining at Blackbird tonight, you know, that you look around and you sit there and you look around at this beautiful village. She truly owned that village in terms of looking after, making sure everything was up to speed. Um, she served on pretty much every committee having to do with planning and zoning that you could imagine. Um, she was on the plan of conservation development for 2014. We then did an implementation element. She chaired that. She accomplished a great thing in government, which is after about a year, she declared victory and we closed down the subcommittee, which we were all very proud of. Um, she was involved with uh, the village district guidelines and pretty much every study that was done while she served on planning and zoning. Um, she was asked to be uh, the chairperson following Laszlo Papp. Uh, she was smarter than I am, so she declined. <laughs> um, so I took the job. Um, but when I was chair and when she was still on the commission, um, she always had my back. Um, she was a counselor. She had institutional memory. Um, she always had great advice. Uh, tough thing with Jean, though, was uh, planning and zoning has their meetings on Tuesday nights. And on Wednesday, uh, I would invariably get an email from her. And I'd say, okay, what did I screw up last night? Once in a while, I'd get a phone call, and then I know, and then I knew I'd really have screwed up badly. Uh, but uh, Gene, myself, and New Canaan will miss you. Rest in peace. Okay. Uh, item number two: minutes. Approval of minutes of the meeting held on March 11, 2024. Any changes to the minutes? Okay. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay. Um, Item number three, housing project development remarks and discussion regarding housing project development, David Genovese, Randy Salvatore. Um, first, uh, thank you for coming. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure Jane has given you all a good brief. Um, but as you know, our primary mission of this committee is to recommend to the town, the Board of Selectmen, a strategy to accomplish our next moratorium. As Randy certainly knows, and David, perhaps you're aware as well, we do have some moving parts in New Canaan. We have a couple of A30G applications in litigation right now. Um, we're also appealing a denial of a moratorium, and we have another moratorium outstanding. All that said, at this point in time, I think our consensus is what we want to work towards in terms of a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen and Town Council is a, pr a fairly significant project, I think, is where we'll come out. Probably 70 to 100 units is what we're thinking. Um, some of the challenges that we're dealing with is first time matters. We've figured out that we probably, you know, given the time a construction project takes place, we'll have an open period. So time matters to us. We want to move quickly. Um, there's, and this is my opinion, there's no completely obvious opportunity um, but there are some very good candidates at locations. Um, but that's another huge challenge for us, though, is how do we fit such a project to the town of New Canaan? How does it fit into New Canaan? And then, of course, as, as you gentlemen well know, costs around our neck of the woods is extremely expensive. Um, 
probably Jane also told you we're running on two tracks right now. One is we have a project development committee to start looking at sites and get that going. And then the second subcommittee we have is to look at financing. How do we pay for things shorter term and longer term? Um, and then the other thing and asking you gentlemen tonight is, is we have mixed backgrounds as members of the subcommittee. And so one of the things that we've recognized is we value and would love some expert advice. And so we've been inviting in um, different experts in, in the world of development. Um, and David, uh, I've watched some of the very innovative work that you've done, particularly in Darien. And I've talked to my friends in planning and zoning in Darien. And, um, you know, congratulations on all the wonderful work you've done. And Randy, all the wonderful work you've done as well. And I also had the pleasure of sitting on the town hall building committee with you. And so I know how good you are. Um, what I thought I would ask each of you to do is perhaps just introduce yourselves, give us a little bit of background, um, and then talk to us on, you know, whatever, however you think um, we should think about going about things, you know, whatever comments you have to, you know, you have to make from your experience as well as your views, and then we'll want to open it up to Q&A from the committee. But uh, David, you're first on the list, so I'll throw it out to you first. I think the New Canaan resident should go first. <laughs> um, well, thank you for having me. Uh, no, it's an honor to be here and to share some thoughts. Um, Randy is far more expert at building housing than me. Um, he's been building housing for a lot longer. I I've done housing only in Darien um, as part of the mixed use projects that I've been a part of uh, in downtown since, I think the first one was in 2007 and eight. Um, I grew up in Darien, you know, worked in investment banking in New York and London, um, back in New York for a few years, and then started Baywater Properties in 2001. Um, initially, I was just buying industrial property, then I got into development. Um, and 1020 Boston Post Road was the first uh, mixed use project that I did. I'm going to be very candid with you. I hope I don't offend anyone or, you know, say anything that you find well, you might find what I say objectionable, some of you, but I, I'll just share with you like my perspective having watched Darianne, and I'll share with you what I think um, Darianne has done well and what Darianne might not have done right at certain points in time. Um, also, I was on the Affordable Housing Advisory Commission, the first, I think it was the first Affordable Housing Advisory Commission, um, gosh, back in like 2010. Um, when I was building... 1020 Post Road, or when I was seeking a zoning approval for 1020 Post Road, which has about 15,000 feet of retail space, retail restaurant space, 10,000 feet of office space, and six apartments. Um, I was working on that project at the same time that um, Christopher and Margaret Stefanoni were proposing to use 830G to build a 30 unit apartment project on Nearwater Lane, um, down the street from my house and across the way from Hinley School, where my kids went to school. Um, I think that was the second 830G application in Darien, the first having been Avalon's um, development of Avalon Darien. Um, the Avalon project was kind of controversial. I wasn't living in Darien at the time, but it was big. It was a significant project. And I think there were the usual fears about impact on schools and so on and so forth. Um, I think that over time, people have realized Avalon was a good thing for Darien. That project was a good thing. Um, but when the Stefanonis proposed their project, people kind of freaked out. And, um, you know, I always say, I, I think that when people, I don't think people in our communities, and I'll say Darianne Canaan could be somewhat similar. I don't think that people in our communities are averse to the creation of affordable housing. But I think that when people buy homes, and for many, like their home is their most significant investment. I personally think that they believe, and I believe that, there's an implicit contract between the town and the homeowner that you'll do what you can to protect the value of their home. And so when 830G, which like I understand the intention of it, I understand why it was designed as it was. I don't believe that a 10% target is like a appropriate target. I think it's sort of arbitrary and probably very unrealistic in these mature built out towns. Um, but when, when you, uh, when 830G is is put in the hands of someone who's, you know, trying to build something in a place that no one would have ever imagined would have a 30 unit project built, um, like on Nearwater Lane in Darien or Old Farm Road or Hoyt Street in Darien or Route 106, um, 
it just freaks people out. And I think that honestly, um, that excitement, that fear, you know, creates a lot of bad energy that then people who are being opportunistic can say, oh, that, they're doing that because they're against affordable housing. And I really truly don't believe that's the case. Um, Darian, we, we, we created an inclusionary zoning um, framework, which I don't think you have. No, you do? Oh, good, okay. You know, the inclusionary zoning to me, I, I did the first project, I built the first project under Darian's inclusionary zoning regulations. It was a small project of just eight units um, with a commercial space on the, on the first floor. Um, it was, there was no negative reaction there was a little bit of concern around parking lot lighting and this sort of thing, because it was on the post road, but abutting a very quiet residential street called um, Highland Avenue. Um, so if you go by a, the post road and Academy Street, you'll see this project It's 745 post road. It's turned out to be a great thing that there, there was no real negativity in zoning. We used the regulations. Um, at that time, the town wanted a payment to the affordable housing trust fund that they had formed. So we made the first payment into that fund. Um, and at that moment, they, they required that. It was at the town's option. They required the funds because um, they were trying to build a bigger project on town property um, for seniors called, well, I forget what it was called, but it was over by Middlesex School. Um, you know, we subsequently put forward uh, our Corbin project, which has a total of about 116 apartments plus 12 units that are off site, all under the inclusionary zoning regulations. And, you know, I would say that there were the usual concerns in zoning hearings about, um, you know, impact on schools or traffic and density. And is this really the direction we want the town to go? But we chose to be really very transparent with the town. We created a website called your downtown Darianne.com. It's still up actually, but it's sort of jumbled. I don't know what happened. It's not as organized as it, it was, but all of the information is still there. And we made it very easy for people in the community to see what we were proposing. And candidly, I would say now years have passed, the scars have healed. Uh, I think the zoning commission was nervous, but the community by and large was not nervous about what we were proposing because we educated them and we shared information on what we were doing. And, um, under the regulations, the Darien zoning regulations or inclusionary regulations, we have to do 12% affordable. Um, now they've increased it to 14. And again, when they increased the, the requirement from 12 to 14, there was no, really no opposition whatsoever. I was meeting with um, Alexandra Daum, who was the commissioner for economic development a few months ago before she actually left her position and went to work at Yale. And I was talking to her about this and she said, when Darian put in place the inclusionary zoning regs, were there like were there protests? Were people worried? And I said I really didn't see any of that, and I was fairly involved. And when they increased it to fourteen percent, there really wasn't any objection. Um, so what I have seen is just that you know people, in in my opinion, in these communities realize that we need to do a better job of creating a mix of housing, but you know. One thing I would caught, I would say, observing or hearing you, I don't. I'm not a believer in 100% affordable projects. Um, I think 100% affordable, and I'm not an expert, so this is one man's view. Um, but I'm. I, I have a feeling. I have the feeling that 100% affordable projects in towns like these can kind of create stigma. And you know, you're the kid in elementary school who lives in the affordable housing project. You know, I think the inclusionary zoning, what's great about inclusionary zoning is it mixes it up. And, um, you know, you also can prioritize town hall employees, which is great. Um, maybe I would suggest adding a provision that, you know, allowed you to inc include employees of, of businesses that are located in the town as a priority, or maybe people who have worked for at least a couple of years or a few years in New Canaan. So people don't, you know, get a job opportunistically to be able to apply for the housing and then change jobs. Um, and lastly, I, I won't keep going. I, I also did for the Corbin project, I, I changed it up because Darian had taken down and rebuilt um, what was called Allen O'Neill and it's now called the Heights of Darien. So that's a hundred percent affordable project on Roten Avenue, just a tip for, for typical affordable units. And then they um, rebuilt and doubled the inventory of what was called the old town hall homes. And that's for seniors. That was, you know, built in the six, 70s or 80s, and it was not well built, and it was crazy. Seniors were living in these apartments on upper floors with exterior staircases. 
um, that were exposed to the elements in the winter. It was kind of scary. Um, so those two projects were doubled, one for typical folks, one for seniors. Then Federal Realty proposed a project of 120 units, which was done with the inclusionary zoning regulations. And that was you know, adding to the count. Um, the Palmer family who own our market, like the Walter Stewart's of Darien, they proposed a project and they were doing typical housing under uh, the inclusionary zoning regulations at 14%. I have a lot of friends who have kids with different abilities. And so I was, in, as I've gotten older and their kids have gotten older, we've been talking a lot about what happens. And there's an acute shortage of housing for adults with disabilities in, in the state of Connecticut. If you have a son or daughter with different abilities, you're basically told that your son or daughter will live with you until you die or become incapacitated, which is crazy. Um, in my opinion. And so we proposed to the town that we build our affordable housing with a further deed restriction to serve adults with different abilities. And so we did that in partnership with an incredible nonprofit called Ableis. And that's been a huge success. The first 12 units were built off site, and there'll be two units on site. And um, it's been really amazing, like creating homes for those folks who really would have otherwise had to leave the area. So sorry, I probably talked for too long, but had a couple of these projects in Darien that I thought could be helpful for you to think about. David, perfect, Randy. Sure, so um, so I'm, uh, so thanks David. So we're in the development business. So for the purpose of this, talk about the multifamily housing that, that we developed and we develop in a lot of areas, but throughout Connecticut, we've developed in all the various cities, um, never in Duquesne too close to home. But, um, like I said, he's much smarter than me. Yeah, that, that, that is um, smart. But, um, and we're building luxury multifamily housing, but in each of these developments, there's an affordable component because of the inclusionary zoning. And inclusionary zoning, my first introduction to it was probably about 20 years ago. We were building in Stanford, and Stanford came up with an inclusionary zoning policy, which was 10% affordability in all of the developments. Anything over 10 apartments, you need to have inclusionary zoning at, I think it's 50% of AMI, so 10% of the units. And it was a big deal when Stanford passed, because I think it was the first city in the state that did it, at least as I recall back then. And different people reacted differently to it, but essentially it's a tax on a developer or the owner of the property in some fashion, if you look at it, because it's a big cost. But people came out, a lot of people in opposition when it first happened, because it's that cost. And then what does that mean, affordability in a building? 10% affordable. And that was in a for sale con development or in a, um, in a rental community. And back then there was a lot of condominiums to, going on. And so, and we built a lot of those different products in Stanford and so on. And the affordable part of it, you're, you're selling, let's say if you were selling a condominium back then for $600,000, you're selling an affordable condo for $200,000. And if you're renting today a two bedroom, uh, apartment in Stanford, let's just use that as an example. Maybe you're getting $3,800 or $4,000. An affordable person, affordable family is renting it for $1,300, $1,400. So it's a significant discount. What's happened fast forward with that is it just got built into the deals economically. And it just, everything reset and it's been incredibly successful. And Stanford's built incredible numbers, well over 1,000 affordable units have been built with that inclusionary policy. And then that started to spread as a normal effect. Um, we've done a lot of the New Haven. New Haven just passed an inclusionary zoning policy where they went up 15%. And what's interesting is that they did it about a year and a half. And, but so many projects got through before it. Subsequent to that, there's been no new projects or maybe one that got approved. Because what I believe in time will help is that they overshot. So 15% affordable is too big of a subsidy to call it for the affordable housing. While they recognize it's a need, it's too big. Hartford, for instance, we do a lot of up in that area, doesn't have any inclusionary zoning and they deal with affordability in different ways. And but subsequent before the new Haven's uh, inclusionary zoning policy, there was a there was a real desire for, for affordability. And we were doing a big development project in the city as an example. And they said they wanted 30% affordable housing. No way we can do it. So, well, if we can get state funds or federal funds in order to do it and equalize it, then then um, then we'll do it. So they said, okay. And in some of those, so we ended up building probably seventy-five or eighty affordable apartments there as part of a broader development. 
but there was state money that they provide in subsidy, the upfront subsidy to provide for this affordability for a period of time. And basically in that, the way it was done, was we took the present value of, let's say, make it simple, let's say a, a market rate unit was $200, $2,000 a month, and an affordable unit based on the AMI that we wanted was $1,000. That's a net cost of $1,000 per month times 12, $12,000. If you're going to do it over a 20-year period, you take a discount rate, you discount it back, and maybe it costs $250,000 of a one-time payment to keep that apartment affordable for the 20 years. Um, and then we provided a grid and said, okay, but if you want it for a different MI, it's going to be different. And um, and so that's the way that that worked. It was a state program that worked. And we had to buy about 12 or $13 million in order to buy down some of those affordable units in that area. And again, that's subsequent to the inclusionary zone. Um, so that's one way that, that, and there's state money out there to do different things. That program is not there, but there's other state money around to, to do various things. The thing is what I would say, and, and I say this as been in New Canaan for about 25 years, and I say this as a resident of New Canaan, as a real estate developer, as kind of the whole picture. There is a major shortage of housing, not just in, in Connecticut, not just in, in any state that's in the country. It's a fact, and there's a huge shortage of affordable housing. And somehow we need to, to solve it. And I, I'm not saying that as some, I'm saying that as a capitalist at heart, but I'm saying it's a real need we have, we have to try to solve. And the other thing I'll say, considering all of the de affordable development that we've done in these, and I'm gonna say luxury for the markets that they were on, there is no issues with building affordable housing stigma for what people think it might be or might not be. We have no have had no issues. What it means is someone just makes less money than what someone else does. Because in these types of projects, everyone needs to go through the same credit checks, the same background checks that a market rate apartment <coughs> unit, or if you were going to do a condominium buy, you need to be financeable. So they still need to borrow money on that $200,000 in your example from back when and what it was. So these are credit worthy people. They just happen to make less money. Um, and so fast forward 20 years from Stanford and all these other towns, there have not been any issues that I've seen in any of the projects that we have. We still own and manage many of the ones that we've built and even in talking to fellow developers. So I think it's really important and maybe you alluded to it about that, what people's thoughts are about affordable housing. And, and I, quite honestly, I think People are all over the place in what they believe in about affordable housing. But I will say there have been no issues, and I don't think there are issues. Where the issues, I think, are bigger and broader have to do with the A30G, which is a reality that we live in. And while many of us might have problems with the whole law or parts of it, I think we also have to be realistic that it's here to stay, at least for the, for the foreseeable future until something changes it. So we need to figure out how to deal with it. And that's where I think it's a bigger issue in that the problem is while we can't have inclusionary zoning and area, the inclusionary zoning just by normal math doesn't catch you up fast. If, if you have 12% or 14% of let's say you built 100 apartments, which would be enormous in New Canaan, which you can pay rent due and so on. But but to do that, so you have 14 over, it just doesn't get us to the moratorium to solve the problem or to make a meaningful difference in terms. So you need to look much beyond inclusionary zoning in order to solve the problem. The, the other thing is, um, and sorry, I'm, I didn't really think about what I was kind of reacting to what David said and rambling, but um, in terms of this, is that affordable housing also, there's so many different types of affordable housing. You have deeply affordable housing, which is where that apartment might rent for $500 as opposed to $1,500. Um, that costs a real lot of money to provide that type of housing. Then you have workforce housing, which is could be up to even 120% of the area median income, which those are the local people working in the school systems or working in the library or potentially just in the firemen in the communities who can qualify for those types of housing. Obviously, just because of that difference of what someone's paying versus the market, because it's a lot less, costs a lot less to provide that, that housing. And so, so when we think about, we have to think about where we're trying to target and then to figure out how to finance it. The, the other thing I'll say is because we, because we deal in these communities and we deal with all the people in the state, 
and they don't have the state recognizes and the state's goal is to provide housing in affordable housing in communities it's like it's a big push that the state has and this is i just uh, had a conversation with the commissioner of housing um, just last week and we were talking about it so i was asking her like we sort of view these other communities where we're looking at the housing and so on and their push for their tax credits for their nine percent tax credits which is a whole different i'm sure Art's going to talk about the financing and vehicles of those different things but nine percent is very competitive to get and what they're targeting in their qualified plan now is communities like Canaan because they recognize that that's where uh, they want to put their money. So I think good projects, there's funding out there, which which is great because it's one thing for the state to say that they that in Canaan needs to have affordable housing. It's another thing for them to say it and then to say that they're going to invest in it, which I think and I think that's new, quite honestly. Uh, but I think it's at least there's a recognition. Of, of that in terms of the other thing the state just came up with a new program where to promote workforce housing in developments. And this is a new thing, and I think one deal been done, we're talking to them about a deal that we have now that we're doing a development deal on it. And what it does is it provides essentially low income mezzanine financing for projects. So they want the project to be 20% affordable. In order to do that, most cities have inclusionary zones. 10% of that, let's say a city has 10% zoning, but already inclusionary zoning, then really all you have to do is provide an additional 10% to qualify for this. Um... Don't tell me I have to start all again. <laughs> yeah, Randy. Okay, from the top. <laughs> but um, so it's a new program. And so they'll provide for every unit that you're providing for affordable housing, $125,000 of 2% financing. For, with a 40 year amortization on the deal. So it's extremely cheap financing of which only half of those have to be new. And the AMIs are very high on that because they recognize of what they're trying to do. So there's not much of a differential of it. And it's a new program that these are financing techniques which sit, towns like New Canaan can use, but it can be used anywhere because again, the state recognizes they need to provide money and in terms of this. And I think that's one of, Government, Governor Lamont's big pushes is affordable housing. So I think um, I think there's a lot of ways to finance it as you move move forward. It's not it's not easy to fill the gaps, but but there's a lot of programs out there now, particularly um, more recently, that'll allow you to have some better chance of it. Thank you, Randy. Questions for David and Randy? Yeah, I'd just like to a quick follow up. Well, first of all, thank you both so much for being here. Um, David has said that he's not a fan of the large, um, all affordable housing. You talked about there being very little pushback or problems with, with the work that you've done, Randy, which, and none of that has been a big 100% affordable. Um, do you see it being different with a big big project, the kind we're talking about that would get us closer to the moratorium we've been asked? So for? I don't, and I think also there again, it's what does that affordable mean? So I think in a in a situation of mixed income type of affordable housing, I don't think there's any issues. I think we've the, everyone has come a long way from the old method of of affordable housing and what that should look like. If you go back to affordable housing that was built 30, 40 years ago, it's cinder block walls. It's it's not even a nice where people would have pride in their home. So I think if you look at now today, the affordable housing that's built or an inclusionary housing, everything is exactly the same. If you were to go into one of those 10% apartments, it's exact, those have granite countertops or Corian or whatever you're putting on the, um, on the, everything is hardwood floors, beautiful appliances, everything, they get to use the amenities within the building. So I think if we keep that in mind, I don't think, I, I don't think it's an issue. Does it have to be 100%? No, it could be 50, it could be 70. I just think we have to be realistic that we're not gonna get it with inclusionary zoning. So therefore we have to do it but you have to build a product that's appropriate um, for it. Because again, if otherwise 830G, as, as we all know, and John, you talked about what's going on in the town, 830G is real. And the, I don't wanna say this, maybe I shouldn't say this publicly, but the town will lose if in these 830G, you know, that's, that's the way they're designed is for towns to lose those, that litigation in the end. So therefore, we need to be conscious of that and make an effort. 
obviously because we believe that affordable housing is important, but also we need to, to, um, to, to not put ourselves in a situation where someone else says we're the affordable or a developer trying to make a profit in an area that doesn't, doesn't matter. It's better for a town like New Canaan to control how, where, and when that affordable housing gets built. And so that's why I think we have to be just, just be proactive as you're doing, which is what this committee is all about, quite honestly. Okay. Oh, I have a question. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I was listening to a conversation with um, when they were looking at some uh, plans to try to create more middle housing, um, you know, I guess up to four to six units to nine units, maybe even. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and Westport, uh, the discussion was about how do you get, we don't need more $3 million condos. What we need is real middle housing that's affordable. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how... Um, having those, like, how do we kind of create an environment that encourages more cost effective and not as big or not as luxury to, to be built? And I think that that's the, the question that I keep kind of rallying around in my head is how do we, how do we kind of hone in on that to, to really make them affordable? Because I think that that's the challenge when you look at some of these policies out there about creating as of right development is that you can't, control what's going in there. Um, and that's part of the issue here is that, mm -hmm. it, you know, that people, it's profit, it's a profit business. And so I, I think that's, that's my question is like, is, are there any suggestions you might have as to how we might, uh, if, or any solution as to how we could figure out how to create that? I mean, it's tricky because, right, this is a risky business that you know, like when we do these projects, I mean, Randy and I, do this in sort of the same way and that it's a lot of our own capital or a couple partners in the in the projects with us we personally guarantee the debt you know we're putting a lot at risk and so um you know the reality of it is it's true i mean like we want to maximize the return on what we do we're tr trying to find especially when i'm working in my hometown we're trying to find that balance between you know creating a good return on, on investment but also doing what we think is responsible for the place um, so there's a tension that I, I, we face a lot more, like working in Darien, I would say, than in other places we might go. But, um, you know, I, I don't know, thinking out loud, I mean, in Darien, for example, the Kensett was built. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with that project, but it's like a planned development. When the developer put it forward to zoning, you know, they said their idea was to age target the marketing. They, they, were, they didn't want it to be age restricted, but they would target and they expected empty nesters to move there. That was their expectation. I actually sincerely believe that's what they thought would happen, but that is not at all what happened. It ended up becoming, you know, a, a, a place that captured some empty nesters, but a lot of young families that wanted a maintenance-free lifestyle because tastes had changed. And no one in that moment, especially, nobody really wanted to like maintain a property or a yard, um, or a lot of people didn't. Um, and the prices ended up being a lot higher than I think we would have expected. And obviously, like, since COVID and the pandemic, like, a lot of these values have really moved upward in a, in a way we couldn't have predicted. Um, but maybe what you could do is, and, you know, this would, be, again, be a process with the community, but maybe you could, you know, work with the, work on certain zones, like identify certain areas where you'd be happier, where you'd be okay having a little more density and say to developers, you know, I'm just thinking out loud, and Randy would have a more expert view on this, but, you know, this is an area where we're more comfortable with a little more density, but in exchange for that, we want, you know, half of the units to be, you know, at, you know, income, you know, um, uh, affordable, affordable to some level that you set. So you will put a natural governor on the price of a unit, a condo or a, a rental in that way. Um, I mean, the methods work, and if you if you set the levels right and you identify where you want it to happen, I, I think that's what that's responsible development. Darian also like changed the zoning regulations around a lot of our office parks and, and and accepted or acknowledged that there are a lot of office buildings in Darian that are really not, you know, desirable places to work anymore. You know, behind the car dealerships on the post road or off of Old Kings Highway North. Um, you know, they rezoned those areas. The zoning board proactively rezoned some of the office districts and basically created an opportunity for housing at a density that they were comfortable. And 
guess what? You know, one of the properties, the Nielsen's property is under contract to be sold. I think Trammell Crow is coming forward with a zoning application this month um, to convert, I think, four of those buildings into apartments. Um, you know, another project down the street off Old Kings Highway North, um, the developer put forward a proposal um, under the regulations. And this is a, you know, that's worth from your, for your zoning commission to look at this. He, he put forward a zoning application under the regulations as drawn by the town, but neighbors didn't like it when they saw what those regulations created and they protested. And then the developer threatened 830G and, you know, used that to negotiate with the town, a settlement. And I think that project is actually happening now with Bell Point. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Like, look at your community and think about where you'd be comfortable with a little bit more density. You have to give something to get something. You have to create an incentive. And if you want a subsidy, or if you, if you want a developer to do something and sell something at a below market rate, a, a price lower than he or she could sell it or rent it otherwise, you have to give them something, whether it's more density or a financing component. No, I agree. What is the just as a um, just a question for the orders of magnitude the the number of units that that you would that need you need right now to be exempt the next for the next moratorium with our base assumptions that um, our current ap moratorium application where a decision is due on May twenty second we receive that approval uh, we're not including the one we're in litigation on we're, yeah. we're assuming nothing happens with the current three A thirty Gs we're between seventy to one hundred units. 70 to 100 all affordable units. Correct. Only adding that stock. Correct. To achieve our next moratorium. Yeah. And okay. But isn't there a limit to the number of moratoriums you can no, you can get? No. I thought there was a limit. Apparently it was fake news. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> fake news? Oh. Fake news. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, apparently, David, what happened was I won't name names and I can't remember them anyway, but a certain attorney <laughs> was chatting that up. And uh, our attorneys ran that down, including talking to that attorney, and that attorney backed off that view. Okay. It's just nobody has ever gotten right. So, um, so with that in mind, I and and I agree with everything you just said. The problem is that is not going to get to the more the, the town is going to have to take an active role to do this and going to have to put in money or find other money to do it. There's just no other way because even if, let's say if you said we could get a development that's 50% affordable, you still increased your other non-affordable, which then increases your number of, it's just pure math. Mm -hmm. So, so I think what, what you were talking about though, of identifying an area, I think that's what, and these are tough things because forget about whether it's affordable or not. People don't want density in their area. Whenever you upzone something, people are upset with it. But unfortunately, there's no other way for, I, I don't see another way for that to work. So I think that this committee or, or some other committee or is gonna have to come up with a region, let's say, or a bunch of different areas where there's developments, where there's sites that can and should accommodate a certain development. And then you need to figure out how to economic find it. I don't, I don't think there's any magic bullet that's gonna solve this thing. And I don't think that the private sector can do it because the private sector is trying to make money off of a development. Now you could partner with an affordable housing developer to do it with the, with the parameters that you're gonna have a certain number of affordable housing units. And the reason why maybe that would make sense is because there's an experience, there's an ability to execute on the deal more efficiently, that they can build less expensive, access to more funding sources because they do this every day of the week. So that's a potential possibility, or you open up a, some areas for it. Again, I think you have to start identifying areas where this can be accommodated. And then maybe then the private sector comes in and partners with the housing authority or partners with the town in some fashion to make it happen. That's the only way I think it can happen based on, on these numbers. Maybe the next moratorium is different or the numbers are different at that point, but with, with the numbers that, that you face, that's the way it has to. Well, so, sort of to that point, Randy and David, is tell, talk to us a little more about economics. Um, and, and what I mean is, for example, land. Mm -hmm. I mean, a town has land. Mm -hmm. So that could help with the economics. I mean, how do we think about the economics of you all as developers? And you know, what are the 
just talk to me if you know what I mean. Sure. Talk to me of the economics of doing a project with you. Well, free land is a great a subsidy. Is the best subsidy, subsidy, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. free land or discounted yeah. land is yeah. Yeah. A, the greatest subsidy mm -hmm. of all. So, I mean, if you have the ability to do that, um, I think Randy's point is a very good one, though. Like partnering with someone who does this versus, you know, the typical town process and you know building school project. Like I think working with a specialist is a good thing. There are a number of affordable housing mm -hmm. developers that are out there um, who I'm sure would love the opportunity to, to build in New Canaan. Um, but if the land is discounted yeah, the or land free. Is discount, but, but if, so the, that's obviously a huge. Depends on the you rental. To, rental you to have that, right? So that's because that equalizes New Canaan to every other area. If the land is free, it mm -hmm. still costs you as much to build here as anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so no matter what, if you have free land, it's you cannot make the economics work for what it's going to cost you to build an apartment versus what you're going to get with rent with the rents that they are. So there's a fact. And that's that gap that I was talking about that I used in New Haven that 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 we had, you know, went through and then we did the present value of it. But however you calculate it, there's that gap that needs to be filled. And so that's where I know Art's going to talk about. That's where you can look to a nine percent tax credit if you can if you can be successful with that. But these numbers are going to be really big, so I don't know I don't know what the availability of these tax credits. Uh, that's um, it's not going to be your typical deal. These are really big numbers when you're talking about building that many apartments there. So it might be some of that. It might be going to the state to to do some. The town might have to bond something with it. I think there's going to have to be a combination of those things. To fill that gap there's still going to be rental income but it's not going to be as much and the other thing is and this is the trade-off right so you can build inexpensive affordable housing but this is new canaan so you need to keep that in mind so therefore it will and it should cost more to build here than maybe someplace else where the aesthetics need to keep within the within the community that's here so that's going to cost money but but it to me in my opinion as a resident here it would be short-sighted not to look at that as well and to invest in it. So, um, so, so I think it'd be a combination of those funding sources, but I think there's going to be pain in some, because some, somewhere this, these buildings or collection of buildings are going to have to go. And most likely the zoning is going to have to change to, to allow for it. And that's, that's a normal political process that you need to go through really? for it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but but it, as I, what I said a little while ago, it's, I, in my opinion, is much better for the town to decide than someone else to decide. And that's really, that's, it's not like there's no decision to be made. It's either someone else is going to decide or the town's going to decide. So as tough of a decision is that the town has, it's still better to be in the hands of the town, I believe, than in the hands of a developer whose goal is just to maximize profits. So. I guess I'd ask this question though. Like, are we saying? So I, I really did think that there was a limit on the number of times you could accomplish a moratorium. Um, so I feel like a real dummy on that. But um, has no so the most moratoria anyone's ever achieved is two. Yes. yes. So I mean, if you look at it, towns in total have ever gotten a moratorium. Have ever gotten one, mm -hmm. and no one's gotten more than two. And six of them have been turned down the first time for a period of up to four months to almost a year. Right. I think Darianne was turned reason. down once on, on one of them and then it, they, they re, you know, they discussed it and it's overturned. But I guess my question though is like, if that's the case and if, if it's statistically improbable that you can keep achieving moratorium, if you, you know, you, you're trying to control the outcome, is it really smart? I mean, is it really a good move to like chase a moratorium in the first place? I think in Darianne, if you were to ask our zoning commissioners and our, our, town planner, I think they would tell you they've kind of abandoned chasing moratorium, moratoria. I think they've taken a view that, you know, it's better to be proactive and constructive and like fostering these situations where they're enabling development to occur, whether it was Darien Commons or the Palmer Project or our project in downtown, Old Town Hall Homes and, and the heights of Darien, and working with the with developers working with people to kind of make progress. And they've sort of said, like, we know we probably aren't gonna overturn 830G or it's not gonna change, but 
what's the point of like doing something just for, I mean, this might be a radical statement in your group here, but what's the point if at the end of the day, all you're going to accomplish is one and then four years from now, you're going to be dealing with the next person who's got a hokey idea to. Except you are. So if you look at it from putting 830G aside, you're providing housing in the town for people who, who can't afford New Canaan. And that is a good thing. It, it really is, I think. And a lot of those people maybe will work in New, New Canaan where they can't right now. So I think, and, and then, if you, then if you get back to the 830G, I think if the town takes a very aggressive approach towards trying to solve the affordable housing problem, right? So there's a big gap between that 10% and where New Canaan is right now. So if you incrementally try to do some things and you build five affordable units in the next four years. That's well, not I, right. But, but I got to believe that when it comes down to it, if New Canaan finds a way and puts real money and so on and builds 70 affordable units, whether it hits the exact part or not, that you'd have a lot better chance of succeeding because that's the goal of the, of the 830G even though it gets misused in a lot of ways. Um, the, other, the other thing that I would say is, well, Darianne, and, and obviously you know Darianne a lot better yeah. than I do, but Darianne is set up different than New Canaan to have a lot of those sites where you can do those types of things. The bigger whether projects. Whether it's the Nielsen Office Park or the Avalon site, so on. New Canaan doesn't have mm. that. New Canaan doesn't have the commercial presence mm. that Darianne mm. has, yeah. split up whether it's office. So, um, so I don't think like converting office buildings, that couldn't happen in New Canaan. There's just no options mm. to do that with, not that I know of around here. I'm sure you're gonna look at all the various sites like that. So I think it's a tougher thing to to have, to incentivize the private sector to do some of those different things here because how do you do it, yeah. right? I don't, I don't think- Well, we moved, I think, I think the numbers are that we moved our affordable housing inventory from like two and a half percent in 2010 to 4.2% today. So that's a pretty significant increase um, Randy's right. I mean, and that doesn't include like what we're doing now or what um, the Palmers are doing, but that's a pretty significant increase before those other projects occurred. And I want to be clear, like I am all for, I mean, I, I think I did the first private affordable housing development in Darien at 1020 Post Road and then the first inclusionary zoning project. So I'm all for the creation of affordable housing. I just, I'm just on a personal level, I'm a bigger believer in like mixed, like mixed housing, not 100% affordable, where you can do it. Um, because I just think it creates a better social environment, a better social situation. I just worry, I just worry on a social level about the stigmatization of, you know, in these kinds of communities, people saying, oh, you know, you live in the affordable housing project. I, I worry about that. Um, well, and David, to that point, Randy, you as well, is there, is a difficult question, but is there a certain percentage of let's call it mixed income that could be affordable without the stigma? Yeah, maybe 50, 50. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't think there's don't any know. magic number. No magic number. Yeah, but I would tell you that at, at so. Avalon, Avalon is 30%. And I don't think anyone considers Avalon Darien an affordable housing project. Right. So there's one data point and, you know, all of our inclusionary zoning is at 14, 12 to 14%. And, no one considers that, but I mean, I would tell you there to Randy's comment earlier, it, and you know this. There's a crisis. I mean, I, the number of calls I get from people every week, and then I call Randy, and I'm like, "Do you have any affordable units?" I keep getting these calls, and people are desperate for housing, and it's 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 really scary. Um, have you have either of you and Randy? You're probably doing larger projects, and David, you're much more focused on your footprint. But have either of you seen strategies in towns where, and this is a longer term strategy, but where, you know, smaller developments are opportunistically purchased? You know, let's say a rundown area of a couple of homes where the homes can be purchased and then, you know, say on the edge of town where they can then put in, put in units, you know, rehab, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that at all? I think it happens. I, I think that's, that happens in even different scales, different towns and different cities. A absolutely. Yeah. That, that happens. So that's where the town needs to though, incentivize those developers with density. So it, again, it comes back to identifying the areas where if current zoning is for a two family house, maybe you can build 10 townhouse apartments in that zone. So therefore then it's, it provides that incentive for 
for someone to do it, as long as there's a certain number of affordable affordable mm -hmm. apartments yeah. to that. Um, or if the town has land, the town can do that as well. So definitely that can that can be done, but it still comes down to changing the zoning because yeah. otherwise it can't yeah. you can't get the density in any of these areas. So you need to pick the areas. Wilton did an affordable senior project by the train station. Mm -hmm. I think it's called Wilton Crossing I think it is. or Wilton yeah. Commons, mm -hmm. Wilton Commons. Mm -hmm. um, that would be worth taking a look at. Mm -hmm. But again, I know under 830G and the state metrics, like you don't get as many points for an affordable senior unit. So they kind of create this lesser incentive to do that. But right. that doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do. Right. I've also, I'm, I can't express strongly enough how much how how you know uh, how strongly I feel for including in this uh, uh, housing for adults with developmental or intellectual disabilities. It, if you dig a little bit through your conversations with friends in your community, I think you'll find like, and you may already have found this. It, it's the shortage is really frightening. People have to relocate out of state to get proper supportive housing. It's really a tragedy, and so I think we can all do better in that with that population as well. And um, you know, we've done it in Darien, and it's been really great to see the outcome. David, I actually I think somebody shared an article with us. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, Chris Wilson, I, I always don't pay attention to people on Zoom, so try to be good for a change. <laughs> Poor guy. Chris, any questions at your end? Uh, not a question. I will comment just about the uh, 830G point. We did have a speaker uh, earlier who talked about you know, the potential, it was Francis Pickering from West Cog, talked about the potential of getting to 10%. And, you know, uh, my takeaway from that, and I think others on the committee share this, is it would be very difficult for us to do. And, you know, the reality is if you got to 10%, the state could move it to 12% and you're back out of compliance again and back into 832. On on the our focus on moratorium, it is actually, you know, part of the, basis, you know, one of the the uh, objectives in the uh, statute that created the committee that we focus on that. Uh, I do think your idea of smaller units spread out or mixed units is great um, and probably something we should look at in the long term. But in terms of getting to the next moratorium, we may be stuck with one large project. And then a question on the um, percentage of affordable that you're doing as for sale versus rental is is rental more predominant? It just seems to me that that seems to be really right, right now. That's that's where the market is. Right now. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? I have a, I have a couple of questions. Um, back to Maria's point <clears throat> earlier about how to dissuade or encourage developers to not build the three million dollar luxury unit and to do something smaller wearing my zoning hat for a moment, how do you, do you as developers feel about square foot maximums on units to keep the unit size intentionally smaller without any sort of other incentive to make you more whole? So to be clear, you're suggesting that you change a zone. So we have some of our, I think it's our um, mixed use commercial zones in town that allow some residential in addition to the commercial have square foot maximums. I think 1,500 square feet okay. is the maximum size of unit that you can build mm -hmm. in that zone. Um, up in other zones, in our apartment and multifamily zone, we have minimums, mm -hmm. maybe the same 15. Actually, mm -hmm. I think in town, it might be 750 square feet. It's like pretty small. I think we have a 1,500 square foot minimum in the apartment and multifamily zone, meaning you have to build something mm -hmm. at least that mm -hmm. big. I think one potential option to Maria's point is to restrict how big the units can be. Obviously that's gonna restrict how much you can sell them for. I can imagine a developer though would not like that. I'm but, not sure if that's true. Yeah, but so just, I'm just trying to fully understand it. So you're suggesting that you would change the regulation so that you, you have a minimum, but what are you gonna give in return? Well, that's what I'm saying. We weren't going to offer anything. <laughs> that's why I expect yeah. you don't like it. But, right, right, right. I just it's not, yeah, but, but to be clear, this is what, what I think. It's not a question of whether we like it. Right, right. It's a function of if it doesn't economically incentivize the development, then it's not going to work. But the, I guess the when you're talking about these kind of numbers, 
the only way you're going to be able to do this is with subsidies and some yeah. other thing. This is not going to be a private development that's going to, you can't incentivize in any way enough so that if you were to pick a piece of property here and say, we'll allow you to build a hundred apartments on this site. And even though it was only zoned for single family, let's just exaggerate the situation. Um, and you, but, and you say you can only build a thousand square feet but if you want them to be affordable, no one can build them because it doesn't work. 830G works is because you have 70% of the market right. in a really strong market like in Canaan that counteracts that 30% affordable. And even 30% is tough to make it, mm -hmm. make it work. Mm -hmm. It's only works also because people know that expires at some point. So then at some point it's gonna be, mm -hmm. you run those numbers back at that, at that point, um, but it's only because New Canaan's such a strong market. So I think you need to, there's, I guess that there is going to be, in order to satisfy this, there is going to be some pain. There's gonna be pain in terms of zoning. There's gonna be pain in terms of economics. Um, and th there's just no other way around it. There's no magic way to make this happen if you wanna make a meaningful um, effort towards the moratorium. Um, and the other stuff, like the things that you just suggested will be incremental, but it's never gonna do enough to do that. Now, can you combine those two things and you can say that we'll allow you the zoning, we'll allow an affordable development and you're gonna partner. So the town is gonna be somehow involved, has to be somehow involved in this thing because they have to fund it and do different things and provide state. But we also only want a certain size units, then you can definitely do that because that's part of the development plan there. Mm -hmm. But if it's all affordable, the market values don't really matter anyways, because those are determined by the mm -hmm. by the AMIs of whatever you want. So I think you need to lay out that as part of the financing plan of how many of this income level you want, how many of this income level. It's all part of the whole capital plan of how it fits fits in. But um, I just think there, there's going to be tough decisions and there's going to be um, politics and there's going to be economic pain in the thing. Um, there's just another way to do it. Yeah, keep in mind, like when you limit, when you when you restrict marketability, or you say these units must be affordable, the rent or the sale price is based on income, not the size of the unit. Mm -hmm. So it's it's yeah, to not be even. Clear, I'm not, I wasn't specifically talking about affordable, you know, with, oh, with oh, a capital or sure, a case. Yeah. I was just talking about development generally. Development generally sure. to bring yeah. down, you know, so that we could because in New Canaan, you know, we've got affordable below 80% of state median income. And we've got market rate, which is 250, 260% of the state median income. And we can call workforce 120% if you want, but there's still a pretty big gap between 120% and 250%. Right. So I'm just talking about okay. that gap. I'm not talking about quote unquote affordable. Okay. So that was my question. Um, my second question is perhaps a little hypothetical here, but um, we're in the situation, some of us on the subcommittee looking at uh, identifying site or sites that are appropriate for this. We're not developers. So I would like to know how you guys go about looking for a site, like what, you know, or, or maybe you just are given sites, but I don't, I don't know how you go out in the market and like what you're looking, I mean, I'm assuming you're looking at zoning. I'm mm -hmm. assuming you're looking at size, like what kind of parameters um, are you looking at? Like, you know, again, I'm not as active as Randy around the state or the region, but I mean, we focus on zoning. We focus on now um, from the experience that we've had in Darien, just being within walking distance of the train, within being walk within walking distance of, you know, the amenities of a downtown. Um, so, you know, I I probably wouldn't do a condominium development or an apartment development, you know, not within walking distance of downtown, um, just because that's not what I've been doing for 15 years. Um, but others would, I mean, and, you know, I think, I think the other key thing, and, and again, I'm, I don't mean to keep bringing it back to Darien, but I think there's something interesting. Darien, if you drive around or you've driven around in the last couple of years, you'd see more development than has ever happened at one time in the place. I mean, there are significant, three significant projects and one or two more to come perhaps. And, you know, if you ask yourself, why is that happening? I think it's because the town, you know, town created inclusionary zoning regulations. They did this 
office building zone rezone thing. Um, and then they really clearly communicated to the market of developers that they were open for business, that they really wanted to see development occur. You know, I think for years, I mean, people, Randy would laugh at like Clay Fowler and other people would come up to me and go, oh my God, I would, that was under my nose. I didn't even think about it because Darian was, I consider Darian so unfriendly to development. Mm -hmm. And you're probably second most unfriendly to development, <laughs> right? I mean, realistically, like, right? And so it, it's tough. You're exacting. You expect a lot of, of developers. And so, you know, that's not a bad thing. But I think when you, and, and, and if you look at the people that did the first projects in Darien, most of them were Darien people. Um, Federal Realty came in from out of town. They saw an opportunity with the Equinox and the train <laughs> station. Um, but for the most part, they were local people who did it. Now we have Trammell Crow coming and Bell Point, so some others are coming in from out of town. But I think, you know, figuring it, you, you're gonna wanna do this. Figure out what you want, where you can see it, you know, where you could accept the density, um, because you're gonna have to give something, density or money, uh, tax abatement, um, and, and, and articulate what you're looking for, and then put it out there, and the market will ultimately speak. Right. You may put forward an idea and no one shows up and people go, you know, it's not enough. Or you may put it out and it's a feeding frenzy and you can negotiate. I mean, it's an interesting, the good thing you have going for you is you live and you work in this amazing town that people want to be here. And I mean, as, if you, you have an incredible, you know, it will be easy to attract people once you lay out what you're looking for, I think. And then you'll have to see what the economics of it are. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think to that question, I think what you'd look for in a market rate development is different in terms of this. You'd look at all those different things that you suggested. I think in this situation, if let's say the, what, what I would say is maybe the way to, to do it is as a town, again, you have to identify where this can possibly go. And if it's town owned land, maybe that's easier, maybe that's tougher, you know, in terms of the politics. But, but so if you say you want to get 75 affordable apartments, and here's the land to do it, then it needs to, the zoning needs to provide for it. So then, and then you can send out an RFP to affordable housing developers and say, these are our parameters. We need this development to be X, Y, and Z. We need a certain amount of this AMI. We need a certain amount of this, we, the aesthetic that we're going to, and you can establish even a, um, I don't know how the plan, where the planning and zoning is set up to do this, but I'm sure it can get set up that this zone is going to, we're going to have certain requirements of what you're going to build here. Mm -hmm. It's going to be only this number of floors. There's going to have this type of a, a look to it. It's got to be fit in with the town so that it can't be something that's totally out of care. You could set up all these mm -hmm. parameters when you sent that RFP out for it. And then you, you allow developers to have the flexibility in terms of their proposals of what they need for the town. So it might be tax relief that you don't have, you don't pay taxes for a period of time. Maybe that's the town's contribution to this land. Maybe it's the town has to contribute a certain amount of money. And then the private sector then, even though it's a, it's affordable housing private sector will come to the town with these this plan, they'll have part of their plan, most likely some of the things that Art will talk about in terms of tax credits and so on, which they're accustomed to going out to get. And, and so then the town can sit there and start evaluating proposals. But I, I think you still need to start with, I know you're, you have the site committee, start where is this gonna go and what is it gonna feel like and look like, or maybe you have a couple options of what that is and send it out to developers for them to do it. And then that becomes that public-private partnership, which takes form through that process at, at some some date of where the town fits into it, what, what the town needs to do. Um, but if the private sector tells, the, the, the problem I think is, is, you know, I'm thinking this through kind of, as we're talking about it, if the town has too many parameters up front, it might limit the response. So I think if you, provide certain framework for it, and then let the private sector tell the town what's necessary. And if it's a competitive process, then you know as the town that you're not overcompensating or over providing something. If you have five affordable housing developers come in and say, the only way we can make this work is with X, Y, and Z, then you know that that's what you have to do if you want that particular affordable housing. Um, and you could directly market it to these two. It's, it's known and who, 
who would be the players in that market and you can send off RFP and do that and then and then evaluate it accordingly. So that's I think what you that that's the way I think maybe you deal with it in terms of but you have to provide the flexible zoning mm -hmm. and, um, and and maybe put that design standards in there or something like that for it. Chris, are you good? I'm good. Okay. Anybody else? Mike? Just real quick. Uh, Randy, the new state program that you were alluding to, I was looking at, at a blurb on it the other day. I might not have gotten this right, but is is it because the AMI is too high or because it's targeted toward workforce that it, uh, it doesn't count toward A30G? Did I get that right? Um, that might be case then. Yes. Yeah, that is correct. Okay. Okay. Then that might not work. And that was that mes financing uh, that I was talking about. Yeah. That might be correct. That I, was, I was curious about if, if we were trying to mix different types of uh, yeah. AMI within a unit and look maybe at state funding under that program, <laughs> do we get boxed out if, if the goal is? Yeah. Okay. But, but to that point, so even if that's the case, because the AMI is too high, if you said, okay, we're going to do it at a certain AMI to satisfy the state, you'd still qualify for the program. So you could still do it. You, you could still do it. You could yeah. still, so you could still get the money. You'd only that, get points though for those that were. Right. In fact, you could find yourself. Eighty percent of state. Right. No, why? Right. Because so you only get points for a unit that yeah. is qualified under eight thirty G. So eighty percent of state median income. Understood. So what I'm saying is, you're already. Let's forget about the state program for a minute. You're going to go out and try to satisfy eight thirty the the requirements to do eight thirty G. Right. So if it's not eighty, it's whatever it is. You're going to do that. You do all that, and then you go to the. The state and you say we're already doing this just because if you're under the, the that AMI you still get the money so I think you'd still get the money I don't think you'd no you'd get the money get but you money. wouldn't get the points you won't get the points yes. you, because you're out of your moderate units will get the forget a moderate why well, can't i will they not do it even lower than the moderate with that program I, I don't think I think okay. there was a floor you couldn't go below. Uh, oh, under that okay. Program. Matters. Wait, okay. Yeah. So if you couldn't go before below the floor, then that would be okay. Okay. I don't know what that floor is. I know the cap is higher than eight thirty J. But okay. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else? So maybe this is an unfair question, but um, so if we wanted to do a hundred units, let's say not very high, so like three floors, four floor, like three floors plus parking underneath, or I don't even know. So um, and how. How big of a land do we need, like roughly, to pull it off? Or is that two buildings? Like, what? It, I mean, is that just like an unfair question? <laughs> well, it's. Um, it matters what you want it to to lay out like. So, in a normal scenario, we're because we're. Well, I'll just say we're building more urban areas, but we're building, let's say, five or six stories. We could build two hundred and fifty apartments on on an acre and a half. So if you say you want a hundred and maybe you come down a little bit and it's not as urban area in, in a couple of acres, you can do that in a three story, three to four story building. I think I'm just kind of doing the math kind mm -hmm. of reverse, mm -hmm. reversing it back. Mm -hmm. So, and I would speak from experience and tell you, don't do a four, don't do underground parking. If you want to <laughs> keep your costs <laughs> under control. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. So those are the costs. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That, yeah big costs. Yeah. And then, you know, the only other thing is I've, I've seen these like um, in other towns, they're they're throwing out some A30Gs and they're really small apartments. They're all one bedroom. They're like no bigger than 536 square feet. And and you made that kind of sort of common like this is New Canaan. You don't really want something that small. Like I, I just, I'm trying to wrap my head around whether that would it ever even make sense for us to try to think about smaller units because those might be more affordable or. I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I don't think I said that that's, too small. I wasn't saying I wasn't commenting on the size of the apartments. If I, but, okay. Yeah. So I I think it matters what I think as a town. Part of it then you you can look to see what what do you think the needs are for affordable housing in the town. And I'm sure there's a need for across the board. So the 575 square foot apartment could be a nice junior one bedroom that a single person can live in, or even a couple that that works around you. So I don't think, um, I think you can do any of it. I think, and it would be less money per se to do it, but but what you don't want to do also, I don't think you go through this whole effort and you build a hundred affordable apartments and it doesn't meet the need of what you're trying to do. Right. So I think That's parallel to this, you try to see, and I don't know how that study gets done, but of where is the need for, for affordable housing in this market? And probably what you'll find is it's every which 
yeah. way of <laughs> of size of it. Yeah, so. well, Scott Hobbs has told us uh, there's a premium on two and three bedroom over yeah. one bedroom. So, yeah. Yeah. gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, hope we can, if you don't mind, call on you in sure. the future if we need some help. Okay. Of course. David, I hope you can find your way back to, to <laughs> Darien. <laughs> Thanks, thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, yeah. I, I just think you also might want to know about gentlemen here that there's even a more vulnerable group who don't have a roof over their head. And a few years ago, there was a soup kitchen in Stanford that was substandard and Randy stepped forward and helped build for Catholic Charities one of the state-of-the-art soup kitchens in the country. Not only is it an outstanding kitchen that serves hundreds of meals a day, but there's barber chairs there where homeless people get their hair cut. There's a laundry there where they get clean, where there's also a small grocery section there. And, and that was taken care of. And David also is deeply involved in the most vulnerable people in our population. And I thought, just thought you might want to know about that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And gentlemen, well done. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Okay. Thank, Thank, you you again. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you. Um, we know where you live, Randy. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> that good luck is good not luck. final. Item number right, four, right, affordable so housing right. financing remarks and discussion regarding the financing affordable housing. Arthur Casavan. Arthur is a member of Arthur Art is a member of the planning, and I've never called you Arthur. Uh, <laughs> Art is a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission, but more importantly, he is one of the recognized experts in the state of Connecticut on affordable housing lending. Uh, Art, I think it'd be great if uh, you remind us a little bit of your background, everything you have done, and then uh, jump into your remarks, if that's okay. Sure, thank you. Um, Dave, John, I appreciate the opportunity to talk in front of the commission. Uh, as John mentioned, I am a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, in terms of my own background, um, I am now retired, so I don't have the money that Randy talks about, but I've done a lot of business with Randy and I'm familiar with David's projects. Um, my background, I've been a resident of New Canaan for more than 30 years. Um, I am a banker by profession. I worked for J.P. Morgan Chase for 29 years. I retired from J.P. Morgan Chase as the chief operating officer of their national community development business. In that capacity, I did billions of dollars of low-income housing and managed low-income housing lending and investing. Uh, after leaving J.P. Morgan Chase, I went to People's United where I ran their community development business. There I did, I managed all of their tax credit investing. I've been on probably 20 boards uh, during the course of my career. I've been the vice chairman of, of um, the largest affordable housing entity for covering Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, a member of the board of uh, Concord Area Trust for Community Housing, and on multiple boards uh, here in the state of Connecticut. During the course of my career, I've done literally either overseen or acted as an investor, a project developer, a sponsor, a debt provider, um, in a variety of capacities during my career. Um, my specialty is actually, I have an MBA in finance. My specialty is actually in finance. I spent the first 15 years of my career in investment banking and then shifted to this uh, when it became apparent that the bank I worked for was going to do multiple acquisitions. Uh, it was imperative that we respond appropriately to the Community Reinvestment Act, which at that point, it was obvious that, that the entity at that point, which was Chase Manhattan, became J.P. Morgan, was inadequate in that area. Um, my particular area of expertise is actually in low-income housing tax credit finance. Um, I will tell you that, and, and I'll make an observation, I don't know if the guys are still here, but you'll note that despite everything that Darian talked about doing, it's still at 4.2%. They are still subject to 830G. They've done a lot. Um, I'm very familiar with uh, Randy's work. Um, Randy, I, I, when I was at People's United, I did a number of projects with Randy and his family, including the one that he kept referring to in New Haven. Um, and I will talk a little bit. I, I know I sent to you guys a deck beforehand, but I'm not sure it's terribly useful to go through the deck unless you guys have questions, because I gave you a chart which is probably the most useful thing to go through. And I will respond to some of the thoughts that these guys provided. Uh, the first is I think that there are a couple of underlying, I call them principles of art, 
that are, are relevant to LIHTC that are really important. The first is nationwide, the number of low income units that are defined as affordable has been at best stable despite an enormous amount of investment over the last decade. The reason for that is that if it ain't deeded, it doesn't count. And so even the notion that was raised here earlier of doing individual units, if it doesn't have a deed on it that guarantees affordability for at least 40 years, then it does not count. And, and a critical issue for this committee is not being fooled because one of the real problems this town ran into is when we did one of our projects here, we made it affordable and then we didn't qualify for 830G. So the question is, are you trying to solve for 830G? Are you trying to solve for affordability? And in fact, in the slides that I sent to you, one of the key things that I would like people to take away is this. Over the years, the only way to build a new affordable housing is to use the low income housing tax credit. I have never seen in my more than 20 years in 30 states of affordable housing finance. And, and by the way, I was a prominent member of an entity called AHIC, which is the Affordable Housing Investors Coalition, which is the national entity that focuses on how to do LIHTC, which I'll talk about in a minute. I have never seen in the last 20 years affordable housing built without the use of tax credits and the other tools that are up there in that board. It can't work. What's distinct from that is whether you use public or private markets. And, and Randy and Dave actually spoke very effectively about a problem I ran into in Hartford more than a decade ago. I was in a meeting in Hartford talking about 830G and affordable housing. I was actually speaking there. And one of the interesting takeaways from that was there were all of the affordable housing commissioners for each of the 170 municipalities in the state of Connecticut. Oh, no, I'm not sure. I'm sure all 170 weren't there. There are a few towns that don't have affordable housing commissions. But a question came up as to how many of them had built any housing in the last 20 years. And the answer was only five. Okay. Municipalities used to build housing, and in the era, the 50s and the 60s, HUD built housing in communities. But the overwhelming preponderance of housing that's built is built by the private market. It builds it more effectively. The, the partnerships that in a particular Randy just talked about are the way to build housing. They build it faster and better. You don't really want to get into the building of development. Relative to New Canaan's existing housing, I'll tell you about the role that I played in each of the projects because I have a great deal of familiarity well before I became involved in zoning. Um, in my capacity of People's United, we bought the tax credits for Mill 1, we bought the tax credits for Mill 2, and we bought the tax credits for Lakeview. Um, and so I am intimately familiar with the challenges and opportunities of each of those projects. The key thing that people have to understand, and this started in the in-rem financings done in the Bronx in 1970s and 80s, Affordable housing as a concept started after Jimmy Carter showed up in the Bronx and, and said, what are we doing with all these abandoned buildings? And what the city did was condemned those properties and contributed them to not-for-profits that became the sponsor for the project. And then new housing was built, but the land is always or almost always contributed. That is true in the projects here in New Canaan. In the case of Mill One, which was the first project that we did a number of years ago. We basically took what was housing, housing that had been built by HUD, it was terrible housing, and we imported pre-built units for about 100, I think it was $170,000 per unit. Um, we moved those on site, they're perfectly good. In the case of Mill 2, again, the land was contributed by the town. We sold the tax credits. The tax credits were sold to a third party that uses them. You put debt on top of it. Those were stick built construction. And obviously you guys know that in the, in the wonderful project we have on Lakeview at this point, it was a beautiful, highly constructed, privately built project. If your challenge, if what you're trying to solve for is to solve for moratoriums, I'm inclined to agree with David. I think that that's a slippery slope. Uh, and I will tell you that my bias is that in my many years of involvement in this, when I go to Hartford, 
and I used to go to Hartford a lot professionally. The only people who care about 830G's repeal are the five or six communities that are wealthy and don't want to have imposition on their rules. And in, you know, again, this is a personal opinion. I, I don't believe 830G is ever going to go away, right? It, the, the votes will not be there. So the question is not only in my mind, how do you solve for 830G, but also how do you build affordable housing? The, Krista hit this on the head. Is it small A or little A? I spoke in front of the community many years ago when the view was being permitted. And there was a concept there that it would be affordable housing with a small A. And I remember getting yelled at as I stood up there. I said, no, you are going to make the ratio worse. There are principles of affordable housing that are hideously painful, but they are real. Number one, if it ain't deeded, it doesn't count. If it's scattered site, it is too expensive to maintain. Don't even think about it. And I've done scattered site and finance scattered site in multiple states. It is a debacle in terms of management of costs. You need to build with a plan that actually gives you housing that will last. And if possible, you want to control that housing. New Canaan has an actual advantage here in that much of the affordable deeded housing is controlled by the New Canaan Housing Authority. So we don't have to worry about what happens at year 41. Most communities have a huge problem, and we're seeing this in the state, in the region, and in the country. Units that were built to be affordable, including units built with low-income housing tax credits, are being ripped out of the affordable framework the minute they get through deed restriction. Now, New York tries to put 99 years on deed restrictions on, but Connecticut is generally 40. So that creates another problem. Even the units that are proposed here in town that are being fought over on 830G, even if those are all built at year 41, the units will convert to market rate. And again, the numerator and the denominator will get to be a problem again a fact that people don't like to think about, but it is a, it, I call it the ticking time bomb of affordability. It is happening nationwide when people say, how come we're putting a lot of money into affordable finance units and yet the ratio doesn't get any better? That's because the units that were built 30 or 40 years ago are rehabbed and they are turned back out to market rate units. And then once again, you say, where's my deed restriction? It has expired, it gets rented at market rate. My other experience, which is based on years of lending and investing experience, is don't even think about housing for sale. It's all in the rental market space because that's the only thing where you have a landlord who will be able to control, manage, properly vet tenants, and get units that stay at least for the 40 years that you provide them. So the, the what I thought I would do tonight, if it's helpful for folks, and I'll take questions at any point that people would like to ask them, is I gave each of you um, a chart, which I did not include in the package. It is a chart that I have used many, many times um, in, in its, by the way, the low income housing tax credit market last year, $17,812,000,000 of low income housing tax credits were syndicated last year. I didn't put that in the, in the transaction but it is important to understand the nature of the low income housing tax credit market just for a minute. It is enormous private market business where tax credits are bought and sold at a variety of prices. There are large syndicators who actually will buy the credits and distribute the credits. And there are private investors. For example, when I worked for People's United, we bought those credits. When I worked for JP Morgan Chase, we bought those credits. The way the credits work, and it's very simple at the core, is the credits are issued by the Department of Treasury to each state. Every state gets an allocation of low-income housing tax credits. The credits are then sold in the open market for whatever value they will bear. In the early day to the days of the program, credits sold for about 42 or 43 cents on the buck. The user gets to take the credit against their consolidated income tax return. In the early days, individuals could buy them. It then became clear they were so complicated. The K-1s were not understood. They became a tool only used by institutions. But by and large, the buyers of low-income housing tax credits are paying in a simple financial transaction for the credits and the losses associated with operating the real estate.
So in a very straightforward real estate transaction, you create a limited partnership. The limited partnership owns the building and the building is financed with a combination of tax credit, debt, and sources of funding from a variety of sources. In most projects, there is no real equity that any of us would think of. The equity comes usually in the form of a contribution of land and in the form of support, tax abatements, housing vouchers, and a variety of other things are the tools that are used to create affordable housing. If you are the chief executive of a town, the very first thing you should look at every Monday morning is what is my current ratio on 830G, right? You, you have to be quite precise as we found out in the moratorium application. You have to say, how am I doing today? How many units do they have? And if they're not deeded, they don't count. And it's a painful process because moderate income housing usually doesn't count. And there's been a huge public policy issue which has hit the entire country here. The money that is made available to the low income housing tax credit program is set by the Department of Treasury. It's allocated to each state based on the number of residents in each state. Every state gets, there's also a small state minimum. So if you're Vermont or Montana, you still get some credits. But the credits are, have to be allocated on something called, by something called a Qualified Application Plan, or the QAP. The QAP is a public document, but it binds the hands of the people in Connecticut, it's CHAFA, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, that awards the credits. Now, if there's anything funny I'll say tonight, the only thing funny I'll say tonight <laughs> is that the perversion of tax credits is a really important thing to understand. The way the credits work is you take the cost of the building and you either get 9% of the cost of the building or 4% of the cost of the building as the credit that you apply against your income taxes. Think of the interesting thing that Dave or Randy would have. The more the building costs, the more credits there are. Unlike almost all finance, if it costs more, it doesn't matter here. In fact, it can be advantageous. Interestingly, credits sell for well more than a dollar a credit now because the owner of the K-1 and the limited partnership gets not only the credit, but the operating losses and the depreciation on the real estate. So what you end up with is if you have a standard building, which is depreciated generally, say over 25 years, depending on whether, you know, just assume it's 25%. But if you're building a $70 million building, you're gonna not only get the value of the credits, if it's a 9% deal, it would be 9% of the cost of the building, not counting the land, basic calculation. And it would be the, the depreciation expense and any operating losses. So the buyer of the credits can make a pretty good deal here. In some cases, the developer, somebody like Randy or his family, might decide to keep the losses, but the losses, the capital contributions, the credits can be allocated any way that you wish to allocate them as stipulated in the limited partnership agreement that governs the particular investment building. So what really happens, and if I could ask you guys just to take a look at this handy dandy chart for a minute, I'm just going to, th this chart is the same as what's up on the board. And Bob, thank you, by the way, for your help in getting all this stuff up here. But what this shows is the typical flow in how a, an affordable housing project is financed. On the right-hand side, you see the sources of money or, or sources of resources, the tax credit investors, the debt providers, and state and local agencies. The land box there is generally either highly discounted or free. That's what leads to the development of large numbers of units. The Allen O'Neill project that was referred to earlier today had a whole bunch of issues, part of the reasons it's renamed. It had a bunch of problems when they went through it. Um, but the credits for Allen O'Neill sold for $1.18 per credit when they were ultimately sold. Okay. What gets interesting is that those sources, and I'll talk about the things underneath each box in a moment, flow in to provide the basis of how you build the project. 
I already talked on the upper left about how the tax credits are allocated from the federal government to Chaffa. But the uses in the bottom left-hand side are relatively important. If you do, and, and Randy's absolutely correct, if we were going to build a housing project to try to close the gap here, what we would probably do is do an RFP for any one of the number of private developers who do this quite routinely. David McCarthy, who was referred to earlier today, um, does this for a living. David is an excellent provider. He actually worked with us extensively on our largest project here in town. Um, he is an excellent guy. He both builds and operates these things, but he's very good at finding debt sources as well. But there are a hundred guys who do this for a living, right? And what they do is they arrange debt and they arrange equity and you can find many construction firms. Viking is an example of an extraordinarily well healed, well done construction firm that routinely builds really great affordable housing. The real rub is, is if, if you are a construction firm, the cost of building and in any building meeting, and you have to meet all the same codes and you have to have a mix of studios and ones and twos, preferably some threes to get credits under the QAP. That, that, that's the rub that's really important here. You can't, you won't get credit if you say, I'm going to build a building full of studios. You just won't get them. Read the QAP is, is, is sort of the, the, the pain that you get back to. But the QAP gives you extra points based on things like, God, I sound like a nerd here, TOZ, transit oriented development, unit distribution, and things like L high. What the hell is L high, right? It's extra low household income. So every banding of income in those units gets you points or fails to get you points in the competitive scoring that goes into how you get tax credits. If you get 9% tax credits, they're, those are what are called allocated tax credits. Those, every state gets a limited batch of those. 4% credits were originally created not to build housing, but to renovate existing housing. They are much smaller in value. They're 4% of the eligible cap cost. And they have a wrinkle. You have to use tax exempt debt with them. And that's an interesting concept as well. Now, the huge advantages, right? There are enormous advantages here in New Canaan. A, we have some town land available. B, we have an extraordinarily high bond rating. I mean, the, the discussion we were just having about um, using a I could tell you from having used state programs, they're a hell of a lot of work and they don't necessarily give you a lot of value for the cost of maintaining, monitoring and administering the programs. They can be valuable. RAP was a great program, uh, which was the rental assistance program, which you and I were talking about earlier, Maria. But are th the, these are the programs that are un done under Chaffa. Are the well, programs so you're talking about. There are two agencies that matter here in Connecticut. Chaffa and DOH, Department of Housing. In many states, they are combined. In some states, they're separate. But basically, in Connecticut, the way it works is Chaffa allocates the credits, and DOH provides debt, frequently under very advantageous terms. Um, sometimes, in fact, I did a project in West Hartford now it's six or seven years ago, where the bank that I was working for at the time was buying the credits, providing the construction finance, and providing permanent debt. And at the last minute, DOH came in and said, we'll do the debt for less. Wasn't even needed. But they said, oh, we'll do it for less, which was annoying to us because we were actually looking forward to the yield on the debt. But the, yet when you work with the state, you, there are two or three critical components, right? Can you get credits? And by the way, we did fours on all three of our projects here. We were not able to get 9% credits. And I'll go back to why we won't. We're not likely to get 9% credits. But we did 4% credits, but we did get very advantageous debt rates from private market sources, most particularly in the case of the Lakeview project, which allowed us to be able to create a cost per unit 
which was in a range that could be built. Incredibly, what you get here is you try to solve when you're, you're a developer or a sponsor of a project, what you're really trying to do is to solve for cost of building that allows the rents to be equal to your cost of carry of debt. That, that, honest to God, that's what you're trying to do. The value in the project is created by the developer who earns the developer fee, which can be as much as 10 per, 12 percent of project costs, by the way. And in fact, if you are a firm like the two gentlemen who were here earlier, they can not only earn a developer fee, they can earn a fee as the constructor. So it is entirely possible for a firm to earn 16 or 17 percent of cap costs up front. Then they can get an administration fee for managing it later on. They can do all of that without actually putting any of their own equity into the project. Great, you know, those of us who grew up in finance would say, wow, this is infinite return. There actually is a way to get an infinite return. There's no cap in. But the quid pro quo here is that you have a cap on the rent that you can charge. So that in New York City, the general way of doing affordable housing over the last couple of years has become 80-20 projects, which are 80% market rate, 20% affordable, but very big projects, you know, 500 units, therefore 100 units of affordable at a time. In a town like New Canaan in 80-20, probably tough to pull off. Um, our current inclusionary zoning really creates an 88-12 or an 88 13. I mean, it, it depends exactly how your unit count works. <coughs> Pretty good. I mean, our core principle when we laid that out in planning and zoning was to make sure that no new building was built that made our ratio worse, right? I mean, it's sort of how we, we came around to that in, in, on our planning and zoning. But going back to this chart just for a second, the way it really works is if you start in a right, you got to figure out who's going to buy, A, you got to get credits, and then who do you sell them to? You could sell them to a bank that is interested in buying them because it reduces their tax liability and it helps meet their requirements under the Community Reinvestment Act. You could sell them to a syndicator. The $17 billion of syndicated credits are then packaged up and sold to third market, third parties that want to buy the tax credits. Basically, they just want to buy the tax credits. They have no interest in the underlying issues. And there are a whole bunch of different credits that you can also use. LIHTC, which I've said 75 times, I've probably not said what it is, stands for Low Income Housing Tax Credit. But there are also solar credits. You may be able to combine new markets tax credits with LIHTC with solar. Most of the projects I've been involved in during the course of my career have multiple credit sources in them, but the core, the meat, the bread, the meat and potatoes is almost always the LIHTC. LIHTC is easily priced, effectively priced in the marketplace. You can guess beforehand how much you'll get per credit within a fairly narrow range. You can guess the value of your credits much more effectively than you can guess the cost of the construction. If you go to the lower left-hand side of that chart just for a minute, you'll see where the money goes in one of these projects. Property acquisition is a huge issue. I mean, and land costs are crazy um, everywhere, but I won't, I, I won't dwell on any one of these, but I'll answer questions. Design and development fees are usually significant. They are separate from the development fees. Design, design, design fees are one thing, developer fees are different. There is a cap which hits them. Usually you're gonna have an architect as well as a developer. And there's a cap, I won't go into the complexities of the cap. Um, then there are the actual environmental remediation fees. For example, in urban settings, in the Bridgeport, New Haven, Stanford and Norwalk projects I've worked on, there was much more remediation necessary. Usually remediation is done outside of projects. It's done by some state agency responsible for remediation. You can't pay for remediation of a material order of magnitude and make the math work. It just, it's too uncertain an event, but it's something you have to keep in your mind. Construction costs, again, I've been retired for a year and a half, but the cheapest cost that I had seen was a little over $650,000 unit a couple of years ago before we've hit this inflationary spiral. My bet, and, and I still watch what unit costs look like. Um, a couple of guys I've worked 
who used to work for me, I talked to quite recently, they've seen a lot of million dollar cost per units. Um, I don't think you'd see that. Much of it depends upon your number of units. Your, the weird thing about this is that building affordable housing costs the exact same as building beautiful market rate housing. You don't save money, you don't shortcut. You may have a mildly different mix of one or two bedrooms, but actually there's more demand for threes. If you can get three bedrooms, they are gold. They're really hard to come by in any marketplace. And if you wanna support families, then you need some three bedrooms. One of the problems on a national level is that over time, the amount of low income housing tax credit hasn't grown dramatically, but the uses of it have grown into four or five major uses. It was originally intended to support low income families. Over the years, seniors, veterans, disabled communities, have all been added to the thing that you're supposed to solve with the same amount of credit you're getting from DC. So, you know, you might get lucky and you might find somebody who fits into two of those categories or three, but even listening to David talk earlier tonight about challenges of, for example, and they're very, very real, but are you going to use your tax credit dollars to the extent that you have them for one of those purposes or another, right? I mean, our se seniors in many cases qualify as low income, but in many cases do not. And you, again, you, in order to be right against 830G, you need to have a deed restriction on the unit. And what we do is we hire an outside firm to verify and to do an annual review of the income of your tenants to ensure that you are in compliance. It's a huge, very complicated. If you think your taxes that you file today are tough, try and do a proper vetting of the tenancy income requirements. For example, if you live in a unit, we had an interesting case in Stanford a number of years ago that generated an incredible amount of media where a family had a couple of kids who grew up in low-income housing, went off, became very successful, still lived in the low-income housing. According to the rules, the kids who were making well over $100,000 each in their new consultant jobs, their income is supposed to be counted. Um, mom wasn't very happy about that, right? Argued, why should that be? In Vermont, we had a situation in Burlington, Vermont, brand new housing was built right on Lake Champlain, spectacular housing. Um, single mom, multiple children, tremendous success story. The mom turned down a promotion that would have doubled her income because to do so would have made her income ineligible. There are a lot of odd things that happen with ensuring that you're in compliance. The most challenging thing, we ran into this right in, in town here, is when you have applicants who wish to live in your units, A, they have to produce tax returns and verification of income, but there is a problem which goes to the gap of affordability. So if you say you have to be eligible and we only, norm, normal rule is you take 30% of somebody's eligible income and we'll talk about vouchers in a second. But if the rent for a unit is $5,000, you have to find somebody who is making less than 100% of median income, but makes enough money based on household side within the MSA calculation to be an eligible renter or else you were in violation of the rules. Now, if you build beautiful housing, people will come, they will come to the schools, they will come because it's new, high quality housing, it's well maintained, but you will not be guaranteed that you will just automatically rent and it's a piece of cake. You have to have an independent certifier to do that. And this is all after you built the housing. The other advantage of doing it to the extent that the town considers a large project, the advantage is that if you do that, you will be able to control your units and you will never have them roll off of your numerator in the 830G calculation. The, the learning point though, and if you look at Westport, Greenwich, Darien, New Canaan, West Hartford, Simsbury, Avon, 
those communities, if you look at them and just Google the performance against 830G, all of those towns are sufficiently short of the necessary number that you need, the state would like you to get to with 830G. They are all therefore subject to the risk of an 830G or perhaps opportunity of an 830G application. So as you go through financing one of these things, you also have other tools. CDBG funds, for example, community development block grant funds are controlled by your congressman. Your congressman can basically use CDBG funds for anything. CDG, I've seen CDBG funds be used for things as important as upgrading the electrical systems in a project in Vermont to uh, some things that are absolutely nuts, but you, your local congressman can help you with CDBG money. And those are those are specific elements of the project. They aren't just CDBG money that's thrown at the project. It, it actually, if, if, if it would be if it would be put into a project, it would be put put in for something specific usually basis eligible, but sometimes not. There are things, for example, if you opted to build um, better playgrounds outside of units, those are not basis eligible. But if somebody said, I can do this with CDBG money, and therefore you have more money inside your project, it's a better way to do it. Um, some private developers, by the way, do not apply for tax abatements ever. They say, I shouldn't ask the town, I'm building this project, We'll pay the property taxes and they or, or get them assessed at an appropriate rate. Other developers take the view that they should get a tax abatement. There are different perspectives on that. Um, in communities that are desperately starved for tax revenue, um, New Haven would be probably the most salient example I would think of here. Providing a tax abatement to build housing that will attract more people into the schools is probably a tough, tough thing to have happen. Um, the, I mean, these are balance points that I've seen go both ways. Uh, vouchers are an important component. There are two types of vouchers that, and, and again, this is the 90 second precy on affordable housing that took me 90 years to understand. <laughs> um, but vouchers come in two forms. They are either project specific, meaning the voucher is tied to a project, and by the way, every project has a unique, what's called bin number, building identification number, and the bin number flows through to everything from your application to get tax credits to the K-1 that gets, you know, on the other end, you know, it, it the bin number becomes important. It becomes the basis that's established, which is used for depreciation, which is used for tax calculations, everything else. But if you get vouchers, they are assigned to a specific builder. If, if you get project vouchers. Individuals can also get what are called portable vouchers. And someone can take that voucher and can use it theoretically at any place, including a non-tax credit eligible building as a supplement to their rent. They are generally administered through HUD budget. It is an interesting issue because the way vouchers basically work is that if your tenant makes $100,000 for ease of calculation, then the annual payment that they would make for rental can't exceed 30,000. There is then a calculation of what the market rate value of the rent of the unit is. The voucher pays the difference. It sits in a line item in the federal department of HUD. It's a big deal, it's a growing deal, and it's gonna be an interesting problem as to whether or not vouchers a, do you have new vouchers and how big, in effect, it's an unlimited obligation of the federal government to pay for as long as the voucher program exists. And who creates the vouchers then? Uh, the st they're administered by state, but they are created, HUD pays for them. And the vouchers- So like like uh, tax credits, they're allocated by HUD to the states? Is that where- we're Yeah, but it's, it's a little more complicated because once they get there, they don't, they're not sticky, they don't ever, they're sticky, they don't ever come out. So this, Maria and I were talking about this earlier. Over the years, there have been numerous variations on a theme of how vouchers should, can, ought to work. <laughs> and you know, if, if you go into a room with 50 or 75 housing practitioners, everybody is sure everybody else has all the vouchers <laughs> and you're not getting your share. 
Now, if you also were to go to the room in Hartford, right, and, and go to the conferences that, you know, are frequently held, um, and they're never held in the state house, they're always held off at, uh, offsite, uh, the view would be that wealthier communities have the resources to build housing, you know, and, and you know, to some significant extent, you would find that you are advantaged. We are advantaged by benefit of our bond rating in particular, right? So, so that if you want to do a simple financing, right, and you want to build 100 units, you donate the land, you get some 4% credits, you bond, you, you can do the construction finance using tax exempt money, you can get tax exempt allocation from DOH and they give you tax exempt allocation to build affordable housing because there's no skin terribly off their back and you'd issue bonds to do it. Um, the, you know, and I, you know, you, if you were in one of these meetings, you know, they would say, well, you know, how much money does a town have? And the state's resources being as they are, they'd say, why would we give resources to the highly resourced communities? And the answer is they do, but even the value of 4% credits is quite significant. Um, if you look at the fact that our inclusionary zoning will create a, a, you know, a significant or a set of units, then that's helpful. You do need to remember that in 40 years, those units will roll off. And so, so Art, it, yeah. as we're sitting here listening to this wonderful primer you're giving us, you just went, you just clicked off contributions the town can make. Yeah. So if we just look at the right side of the page, yep. we can provide the land. Yep. We can in some some way be a debt provider. Yep. Right. And we can do business with the state and local agencies, or we can be a state and local agency ourselves, for instance, if we decided we wanted to do tax abatements. So we do have a number of tools there on the financing side, which Oh, there's a ton of tools. So so if you start in the center, if the project sponsor is the New Canaan Housing Authority. I, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. So, so let's go through a, a prototypical example. I think I'll probably hit your question. So your sponsor says, I want to build affordable housing. First thing they're going to do is identify a site. David and you know Randy were absolutely right. But then you say, what do I want to build and how much does it cost? You would create a limited partnership that would become the solicitor of an RFP from multiple <coughs> sources to build whatever it is you want to build. That would apply to the state under the qualified application plan for an allocation of tax credits. One might apply for 9% credits, but you have to look at the scoring mechanisms to determine whether you get that. So the rub that you get when, if you were to apply for 9% credits um, is that you you, you're gonna have to, for example, have more 50% units and you need 50% units and 80% units and 100% units and probably no 120% units in order to potentially score high enough. And, this, and by the way, Chaffa publishes the scoring for every applicant during the round. And Chaffa's our counterparty in seeking out those. Uh, Ch Chaffa is the agency that receives the credit that it, it, they, it they, publishes the qualified application plan. We apply it to them and they- They apply, but they literally score every project. And you know, people are saying, well, you know, Chaff is not giving me what I need, but they score every project. Now there are always some gray areas, but you know, they would award their nine per, limited 9% <coughs> credits to the stop, top scoring projects. They then, you know, if you don't get 9%, you would then say, well, I'll do 4%, right? As a source of equity those are unlimited by statute. So they, they can give you those, but they come with the wrinkle I mentioned earlier that you have to use tax exempt debt. You can use tax exempt debt as from the construction loan as qualifier under the total amount that you need to use. But typically you'll do a taxable construction loan from a bank but convert it to a permanent tax exempt debt instrument to meet the 50% qualification, which is 50% of the total project cost has to be using tax exempt debt. And who's the issuer of the tax exempt debt? Well, that's again, and, and normally 
in this, if you were doing a project in New Canaan, the housing authority would be the issuer. Yeah. And it would receive tax exempt status from the town. No, actually from Hartford. Oh. Hartford has to provide that. But, you know, again, you, you get to how many units and do you want to have 100%? As a practitioner of affordable housing, I wholeheartedly endorse what was said by both of these guys. You don't want to have 100% affordable housing. You just don't. But it, it, it stigmatized. It's not healthy for anybody. But if you're trying to solve for 830G, you do want to. Especially if we're trying to trying to nail down the first moratorium, so we can then start thinking a little bit longer term. Yeah, and 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 again, the, the, I'm I'm not going to render an opinion about whether trying to get a moratorium is a useful path to take. I'm only trying to say, how would you finance it if you if you said you want to build? Yeah, the building? understood. Thank you, you could build a building that's eighty percent market rate, twenty percent affordable. Um, but you can't really use tax credits to do that. Then you're just using debt markets. You could contribute the land. I mean, there, there are a number that have tried to use tax credits in 8020s, but you have to create two separate limited partnerships to own the building. Mm -hmm. And you have to provide absolutely equal access to everything. So if you build a swimming pool on the 23rd floor, 100% of your tenants have to have access to everything. And, and that's a good thing, but it also leads to either what you want to build in the first place. So, so Art, does, does that problem arise with anything under 100% affordable? Yes. So, you know, you, you get to the calculation of, let's say you wanted to do a 60-40 or a 70-30 with the balance towards market rate difference. You, you just have to ask yourself, right, if you do that, then you have a different situation. You could get, you could do an RFP with a developer and ask a developer to do a 70-30. Randy said tonight, I think what I heard Randy say is that'd be hard to do. I've seen his spreadsheets before and I do know why he'd say that. 80-20 um, is sort of the point at which it works. But if you do 80-20, you know, you're getting a lot more units and you, you still, you know, you would do better against 830G, but you're not closing the gap from wherever we're at today to what we want to get to. So you're still not eliminating the risk of, of um, being subject to 830G if it's... No, but, but I mean, um, if, if you don't do a 100% affordable project, right. you're still able to avail yourself the tax credits, the system, so to speak. You can, not. yeah, yeah, you can. You, you, it becomes more complicated yeah. because, in order to leverage the credits, what you do is you create, in effect, a condominium within the project. Yeah. Okay. So if it was 101 Main Street, you'd have 101 A and 101 B. Yeah. Got it. And you have to segregate each of the components of the mm -hmm. financing. And though. NYCHA would only or. Sorry, that's New York. But the New Canaan Housing Authority would only then be the administrator of the affordable units. Uh, it, it could actually administer all of them, but okay. its charter, I, I, in a marketplace sense, it could. Its charter, I think, doesn't accommodate that okay. terribly well. So that's the two limited yeah. partnerships. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you could amend its charter to allow it to do that. But then you get into the question of whether the town or an element of the town wishes to be a developer, <laughs> a landlord, and an administrator. Mm -hmm. And the administration, <clears throat> as you know, we had to change administrators a couple of years ago here in, in town. Um, you got to get really good administration when it gets to things like rent and you know both qualification and, and certification. Hey, Art, on the, um, um, on the limitation to 40 years, um, I mean, I've had a number of planners say to me, no, we could go beyond 40 years. I'm not talking about, is, is that a state rule, so to speak? Is the, it an the state rule? mandates 40 years. But at a minimum. But can, at a minimum. It could but be we, more. Could, we could exceed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's you another could. lever. The so why? The why? Nine years, I think. Yeah. Why wouldn't you go beyond 40 years? I don't get it. It's a develop the developer. Yeah, the developers, the developers, don't, want developers to. don't want to do it. So, so but, it, but if 
but if they but were if we the town were the developer yeah. we would yeah if the, ta if the town's right. developer though you don't have to worry about it because you'll never let the units go out uh, although you'd probably codify it with a deed so you don't know what a future administration and, might and do. developers really are thinking 40 years out oh oh absolutely okay. they, they are they absolutely in their pocket yeah, they're, yeah, they're going to convert every one of these units the day it's eligible. As soon as that tenant vacates, the, yeah. then. Are, is, have you seen other housing authorities do anything other than 100% uh, affordable projects? Uh, not in Connecticut, what? Because there's been so little development in Connecticut that's not private market. Mm -hmm. uh, almost all the stuff that's been done in Connecticut that I'm familiar with has been done by. A private developer in conjunction with somebody like Darianne, right? The housing authority. In other states, I have seen that, but it's usually where you have a not for profit that is experienced in the development of projects and syndication of the financing of those projects. And they, they do do them. They're, they're also difficult to administer. Lest you think that this is a Connecticut problem in Vermont. Um, one of the, the leading provider of affordable housing in Northern New England is a single entity. It covers all three states. I was the vice chairman of the board of it. We merged the New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont entities to create a single entity. And we, in one case, we spent seven years fighting with a municipality in Vermont to actually build 16 units of affordable housing in the middle of a field far away from anywhere. And, and it took seven years of legal battles to actually get through that. So Art, um, if you were in our shoes, what are the key swing thoughts of how would so, you go about things? So, so, so um, number one, I mean, you, your first question here is if your primary objective is to gain a protection against 830G, we need to do a better job of selling what it is. You, you'll notice one of the slides I did was all the stuff we've done. We've done a lot in this town. It didn't carry sway when we applied um, for our last moratorium. And I'm not sure that it is a you know longer, but you know, A, you want to do that. Two, if your objective is to control your housing, then I think you do consider a building housing under the uh, sponsorship, you, you would put New Canaan Housing Authority in that center box and say they'd be this project sponsor. You, If you were to contribute the land um, and you were, or at least sell it at a significant discount, and you were to get 4% tax credits and use the town's bonding capacity, um, you would probably be able to build housing by using a private partnership with a developer um, because you know the, the folks who built the library or building St. Aloysius, whatever it is, would very easily, or get a Viking and they'll build the housing. You can designate, for example, that you wanna have multiple uses, senior housing, affordable housing, disabled housing, veterans housing, but I, I will tell you that if you designate that, then you do end up with long lease periods before you find eligible lessors who both meet the qualifications. And you know, you, it, it, it sounds like a great idea to say, I want to build this and I want 20 units to be senior and I want 20 units to be low income and four units to be handicapped. Handicapped and disabled housing is significantly more expensive, by the way. That, the other categories are not. They, they tend to construction costs are quite similar, or at least in my experience, they were quite similar. But you're saying it would take longer to lease out. So. It would probably be, take longer to lease. You know, the, the problem with seniors is that um, all seniors are sure that they're low income, but they're not. And and um, the you know the the problem is, and we've seen this throughout New England in particular, is that people want workforce housing, but in most cases. Employees of the town don't qualify uh, because it's a you know you know it, it's not just a matter of teachers or police officers not qualifying. Even the folks who work for the town are usually married, and it's a joint tax return, and they blow right through the cap. And um, you know it, it's a it's part of the problem about selling affordable housing because it's really easy to say, well, we're going to build this. You can't limit it, for example, legally to your own town. Yeah. 
and and those are other challenges and so you can you know you can build it and say i want my teachers to live there but if they're married and their household income exceeds they're not eligible any other questions for Art? i have one other question i i mean obviously we can read the qap but it sounds like the qap dictates the policy by which the tax credits get distributed in particular the nine percent the nine percent yeah Meanwhile, we're trying to assess the need of what type, what unit mix New Canaan still continues to need for affordable housing. Is is there any mismatch there between what the QAP? The QAP enco encourages you to build a mix of units with a focus on one, twos, and some threes. So in a normal project, there will be no studios. Okay. I, I don't think it used to be they didn't even give you points for a studio. They want you to have a one bedroom. And used, you know, the old mix used to be 25, 50 for twos, 25 for threes, was sort of the target mix in most, and that's pretty standard in QAPs in most states. Okay. Um, I, and I, 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 to be honest, I haven't glanced at the QAP that's out there right now, but it's pretty clear. But then they weight those, the, the second weighting, which gets really important, is the income level. So there is a, you'll get a lot of points for doing 50% income, uh, you know, which is extra low EL mm -hmm. and in the category, you know, but <laughs> then you, then you get into, you know, weighting the units and weighting the costs and, and how you get, get the points and allocation. I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you guys. I will come back anytime you, I could be helpful Thanks. to do Super that. Art. Thank you, Art. Thank you very much. So thank you, Art. And we will call on you again, Art. You know where to find me. Yeah, I do. <laughs> we'll just show up at PNC. There you go. <laughs> Throw the rocks at me. Right, we're going to put an anchor bracelet on you. How do you know that? I'll put all Okay. Have a good night, Art. Thanks Thank again. Thanks so much. Item number five project development subcommittee update and discussion with the committee, Krista Nielsen. Uh, so we, our subcommittee had a meeting on April 1st, and at that time we just sort of talked about our purview of, of what we're being asked to do and how we want to go about it. Um, and so my takeaways in general were that we need to kind of come up with a list and we came up with some criteria of properties that we'd be looking for. I'm currently working with the town's GIS provider to call that information so that we can bring it back to our next meeting on April 29th to start kind of going through that list, looking at what's there and talking about criteria by which we evaluate different potential properties that are on the list. Okay. Short version. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, any, I, I think the answer is no, but any, any thoughts at this point as to needs for outside expertise or still? I mean, I don't have anything more than we discussed at our meeting on the first. I mean, mm -hmm. we will need assistance. Okay. I think we're a little premature, but okay. know enough to know when, you know, the moment's gonna come that we're gonna need that, so. Okay. Any other questions for Chris? Okay. Um, Chris, by the way, are you really in the UK? I'm really in the UK. It's, pretty late. it's really two in the morning. <laughs> oh man, what a trooper. Okay, financing subcommittee, update and discussion with the committee, Chris Wilson. So we had our meeting on October, on April 4th. Um, uh, Maria was initially uh, designated the leader. She was uh, uh, not interested in leading going forward. So after a bit of discussion, uh, I agreed to uh, be the subcommittee chair going forward. Um, we have two primary objectives. Um, for the committee. One is to look at uh, revenue to support affordable housing development. And that's uh, looking at what we're doing right now um, and if it's sufficient and whether we should recommend uh, additions to that. Uh, the second being understanding um, the financing sources for future projects outside of the uh, segregated funds that are available. Um, Additional topics that we will pick up um, are the benefits of establishing uh, an affordable housing trust. A number of the neighboring towns have uh, affordable housing trusts rather than just a segregated account. 
on the town's books. Um, second thing was potential to attract project vouchers from the state. Um, Art touched on vouchers and vouchers are important in making projects uh, work better economically um, as they provide more income. And, and then third, the potential to attract uh, Section 8 tenants to future affordable housing projects. Um, and we set a meeting schedule, which will generally be the first Monday. Um, we are probably going to ask Art to come back and speak to us specifically uh, at a future meeting. Um, and we may bring in uh, people from neighboring affordable housing trusts, as well as um, somebody like David McCarthy to understand the financing of the past affordable housing developments in the Canaan a little bit better. That's it. Any Thank you, Chris. Any questions for Chris? Are we good? Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, item number seven, speakers, discussion of future speakers, Jane Williams. Thank you. Um, it's grateful to our speakers tonight, and I'm very happy that a number of you have sent suggestions of guests and topics. Please send me feedback um, and also continue to send ideas. We have a, a bunch of thoughts in the hopper um, and um, have to do some more thinking about that, but it's obviously people are happy to come talk to us. So um, the important thing is going to be keeping pace with the committee and, and choosing topics and speakers that feel relevant and worth our, worth our time. So I really appreciate your input and feedback on that. I did wanna say that um, Scott Hobbs is helping arrange a tour for us of housing here in town. Um, and it looks as if we can do that one afternoon, the week of the 29th. So I'll send out an email to all of you or John and I will seeing which of the afternoons that week makes the most sense. He seems to think it, there's flexibility on their part for it. So appreciate that from Scott. Um, I think that's it for me. Yeah, and Jane, just to add, I, I think we're, we're thinking of potentially a couple of the regional planning organizations um, yeah. to get their view of affordable housing needs and the, 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 the terrain, so to speak, uh, in the area. So that that's one area Absolutely. we're looking at. And we've talked about, um, leaders in other towns, whether you feel that having talked to Randy and, and um, David tonight, we want to do that next time, but we, we did talk about that. Um, talk and about and I think experience. particularly one of them was potentially some planning and zoning type people yeah. from a co couple of exactly. other towns to talk about, yeah. you know, how are they attacking this? Didn't right. We, didn't we Jack. pick up that Greenwich is trying some mm -hmm. things that might be a little bit- uh, And Margarita Alban from yeah. Greenwich is <clears throat> one. Right. So, um, <clears throat> That's probably something we'd want to do next month. Yeah. And by the way, Sarah Casey offered, um, she thinks it's important for us to understand the, the national context in yeah. summary, what other states are doing, at least in our neck of the woods. And she said she'd be happy to do that. It's something that she passionately keeps track of. So we could do that um, at this, you know, the same time as we talk about other towns in our region. Okay, and then, then uh, another one that I've been talking to Jane about, I sent you all some of the stuff that he's done is Glenn Childer, who is a Connecticut planner. Mm -hmm. And I think Glenn could be interesting to listen to Glenn because Glenn's worked with a number of towns on their affordable housing efforts, their affordable housing committees, and particularly um, how you do communicate to the community, you know, what, what these affordable housing committees are trying to achieve what it can mean both positively and negatively as we've been talking about tonight. Yep. John, uh, that's yeah. something I think we want to make certain doesn't fall off the, off yeah. the uh, because we do have a, we have a formal obligation within the, the, uh, uh, the charter yeah. to educate the town. But I think it's also something we should be thinking about because in edu uh, we heard that tonight, educating the town, yeah. help them do things which they might not have been, other been otherwise been able to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and I, I, my, I, I think that we at some point want to do a very significant interact. Let, let's just, this will jump me into number eight. So mm -hmm. thank you for that softball, Jeff. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think w one of the things we definitely have to do is, you know, how do we communicate 
you know, what we're doing. And, and I see that as a couple of steps. I mean, one idea that I had is in the more near term, and I'm happy to take a shot at a draft, is to draft something to just update the community. I mean, there's good reporting from Sentinel and the New Canaanite, um, but draft something, just update the community. Deanna has uh, her periodic newsletter, so that's one vehicle we could use. And then, of course, out to the publication. So one idea, if you guys thought it was a good idea, was I, in the near term, put something together, just an update at the Affordable Housing Committee. I think bigger will be getting more in front of the community. Perhaps it's a community workshop, something like that. Um, but, you know, you have to be ready for prime time to do something like that. And so, for example, you know, we're, we're almost all the way into May now. Next, we're now in June. And then anybody who's done town work knows that you don't do anything in, you know, late June through the end of August. So that puts us in September. But, you know, just sort of thinking bigger picture, you know, one of my ideas is do we think about some sort of community workshop for September? I, I think just, you know, thoughts on that? Great idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. Great idea. Okay. And your letter is a great idea too. You guys, is that a good idea? No. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to your point, Jeff, and anything. Uh, I mean, well, let's talk about it. What does that that two prong strategy? What what else should we be thinking about, if anything? Uh, <clears throat> how do we? prepare the town for some of the tough trade-offs, the pain mm -hmm. people allude to um, in our conversations here. Um, how do we really educate the town? Um, <coughs> I, it, it occurred to me tonight that we have a bit of a public relations problem. <coughs> the three people who spoke talked about how it's not ideal. It's not anybody's first choice to build one big building, 100% affordable. Mm -hmm. Um, that said, um, it, if that's what we're going to do, we need to build support for it. And I'm not sure the way to build support is to say we have to. Um, maybe it is, I don't know. But I, I, I think that is, that's a question we really need to, to talk about is how do we bring the conversation and the challenges within it transparently to our neighbors. Well, it brings up part of that. I'm, Deanna's looking at me, I'm looking at Deanna, mm -hmm. is you know, remembering the fact that we're going to recommend to the Board of Selectmen so we can punt the problem onto them. That's a joke. <laughs> um, but um, you know, I, I think part of that will be, I mean, I, I, I like what I just said. We do a community workshop, but ultimately, you know, we'll have to take it to, to the Board of Selectmen and Town Council. And so we'll come with recommendations. Um, so I think what we have to discuss with, with you all is also have, how do you want to pace that as well? I think, you know, um, um, May 22nd is going to be a big turning back yes. all of this. Mm -hmm. I think if we don't get the moratorium on May 22nd, we have a very different, you know, different strategy ahead of us. You know, if we can't get moratoriums by having very qualified units and the state's going to give us a bunch of hurdles that we can't overcome, then we have to maybe look at a very different strategy than what we mm -hmm. are doing now. So um, it's kind of hard because it's, it's over a month away. Um, but it's only over a month away. Yeah. At the same time, right? That's true. That's true. But you guys have such great momentum. And so I like, you know, I don't want to stop all the momentum of, you know, the work that you're doing. Um, but I do believe that that's a big decision point for the community. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I think, too, once we have more specifics, like if we have real concrete location ideas, it's mm -hmm. kind of like with the police station when, when that, when options were unveiled. And it came time for the community to weigh in. I think right now things are a little bit abstract. So what are we trying to do? I mean, and there are a lot of sort of X factors out there. But I think I do think once we've come up with a couple of sites that we think are, are good, mm -hmm. um, town land, you know, that always will bring people out 
to say why this is a good idea, why this is a bad idea. And perhaps if we get the moratorium or if we don't, that that impacts the scale of what we're doing, mm -hmm. all of that. So, but I think once the community hears some more specifics and you know how we're gonna finance it, it's very complicated, but I think there is a way to boil it down and say, actually, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get some tax credits, but we're gonna have to bond this and it's gonna be this amount of money. That I, I think putting that meat on the bone is really helpful to get community involvement. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the key is the land. I mean, if yeah. we, we're not, uh, and I think everyone's told us that, I think the housing authority, we found that out ourselves. It's, it's a doable when, when, the, when the land is there. And we went through the tax credit process. We had debt financing. Uh, fortunately, we had the town soft money from the uh, from the affordable housing fund to get all the soft costs going. So that's very uh, expensive right up front. Um, but it's certainly doable. But I mean, I, I think it, it just starts with the land, the land, the land. I mean, that's what we keep getting uh, drummed in, into our heads. One thing I, that I'm struggling a little bit with is the, the balance between uh, I, I think our our, um, our our goal, you know, what we've been charged with is you know to look at a moratorium, and I think I think that's our goal. Um, I do understand the commentary we heard tonight about you know trying to balance and do we want 100% affordable. Um, I, I know that the housing authority, we, we it is it is balkanized there. I mean, it, it's true, and uh, it, it sort of like sets up a separate silo of, of folks living in a, a certain little you know community, which. Not sure it's the best thing in the world, but by the same token, if, if that's what the state has done to you, if things don't, <laughs> let's be honest. Yeah. I mean, they have created legislation that has created an incentive to make the kind of housing that you have to make to make it work financially for anybody. But, but I, I think that our decision may be made for us uh, uh, once May comes and uh, which, which way we have to go. Exactly. Yeah, I mean. Look, I, this committee has been proceeding on the assumption I mean, that that's in the moratorium mm -hmm. is granted. Yes. I completely agree. If it's not, then, yeah, then we need to. If it's not, then, like, why bother having a moratorium <laughs> yeah. exception in the statute? I mean, that's kind of the way I read it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, who knows? <laughs> Jane, to your point earlier in terms of the public and the trade offs, I mean, I'm still kind of digesting all of what we've heard tonight, which is a lot. And obviously this is a very complicated topic, but I think at some point we can probably get this down to like, you know, this is like a machine that has to function and here are the different levers. You know, if you, if you want low density, then, you know, we're going to have to have multiple sites or, you know, th these are the trade-offs and I don't know if that looks like a decision matrix or if it's just like, you know, you push this one up to the top, then we got to bring this one down to the bottom. If it's lovers the way I'm envisioning it, but there's got to be some way to conceptualize some of these decision points that we're making and, you know, okay, if you, if you want this, then we've got to do that. Like it's not. Krista, I think, I think when you were talking about starting with a piece of land, when that, when that's been the discussion, I think that's what we have to do is we have to start with a piece of land and then see what we can fit and what we want to fit and in what format we want to fit it. And then we can start talking about financing. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think that's, there's much wisdom in kind of doing a hypothetical mm -hmm. and, the, and the land's the constraining thing. And it's also the thing that, that we, if we end up prevailing on the town to contribute the land, it's something that we control. I just think we need to then be able to talk the public through the thought process and the evaluation we went through to get to the project that the we're lies, talking about, right? right? Like, yeah. you know, we decided yeah. we're gonna use this piece of land. It can only fit X number of units. Therefore we had to do this height, you know, whatever, how that plays out, I don't know, but. But, but your interim step, let's say you go with the community workshop idea, it's not saying it's going to be this piece of land. Here's a couple of candidates. Right. And yeah, here's think... potentially what projects could look at on those various. Right, and if, if the community doesn't want 100% affordable, well then we've got to build more and we have to look at multiple sites as opposed to, you know, like those are the trade-offs. Yeah. We need X number of hue points. So by the way, Chris, Chris, Chris Wilson is... has his hand up. Chris. Yeah, I think I think let's keep in mind this forum is public and and you know we can use this our, our regular meetings uh maybe with a little more publicity to encourage uh, attendance of the community as a way of educating as well or a way of communicating about ideas. Good idea. We don't have to just do it through other formats. 
I mean, this, this session was really good. Yeah. I think this is one that we should really provide that link to in our communications yeah. and okay. make sure that people yeah. so that they can watch it because it's a great, yeah. it's a great. No, I mean, look, Chris completely agree. Um, and if we can help in, in the office with, you know, press releases or, um, you know, um, we have social media and obviously the main website, you know, every, every week we go through, you know, sort of what are the top stories we want to highlight on the website and things like that. But there's multiple points of contact that we can utilize um, to help get the message out to the community. So, no, that's a good idea. Maybe, I mean, I was going to be cynical based upon experience, <laughs> which is the community turns out when the community Mm -hmm. feels they need to turn out or wants to turn out that said actually that's a good idea and maybe what we do is we pull together next month's agenda we figure out who the speakers are going to be mm -hmm. and then maybe uh, maybe we do try to do a better job of publicizing okay here's the next meeting who's on the agenda et cetera, et cetera. so that could help okay. our next meeting is oh, May. May 13th. okay so it's a little bit before the other thing is, I mean, I think we should all take comfort in the fact that they were saying that really their, their communities, the communities are accepting of mm -hmm. all of this. So it's not like we have an uphill battle. We've been doing this. It's not new. It's not a new concept. So I think that's also something we need to remember is that, you know, I think more people are on board than we expect. Um, I think I know the answer to this question, but is it ever a topic in here? Do we ever talk about? the existing liquidity the i'm i'm reticent because we're in litigation mm -hmm. um and and feel free to push back diana feel free to give I your view i as a former well there I you go by legal yeah. Counsel to this yeah okay so as a former p and z chairman who's gone through a lot of litigation i'm looking at mike sweeney uh, it's a joke, Mike. <laughs> Mike and I used to face off on a on a fun, well, good I, basis. I figured uh, that was the answer, no, but I thought we should yeah. have it on the record so people yeah. don't ask us. Yeah. Actually, that's that's a very good point. Is is we, yes, due to the litigation, um, council has advised us to stay away from that. So. Yeah, I mean, to your point about location, I mean, it, that's when the rubber's going to hit the road, uh, mm -hmm. and. Because I know with, with all the housing authority applications that we had over the years, very little opposition. You know, once in a while, some would come out. and But the, actually, in front of the, the zoning commission, they, they went through pretty smoothly. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about things around the edges, you know, parking and how tall it was going to be here and, and, you know, looming of the building, you know, those type of issues. But it, it all got down to details. But again, it, it was balkanized, you know, in the area where, where most of the, well, all the housing authority uh, projects are so it didn't get attention but um i suspect well, that'll yeah. be different next you know, no, i think when you look at if we if we start from the premise that it's going to be on town land town donated land um <laughs> which sounds like the most economically feasible to do, we hit there is a there's a list of town buildings but some of them are like a shed at the nature center and of that ilk so large pieces of land that's town owned currently if we want to stay within the town utilities is a pretty circumscribed area. So, you know, and again, I, so I think when you start looking at if you, if we want to set that criteria, which we haven't necessarily wedded ourselves to yet, it does limit us quite a bit. And I think there will be quite a bit of reaction to what those might be. Um, there's a great presentation that was done in, in the context of the police station, building the police station that analyzed 11 different sites. It says whether they're hooked up to utilities, it has the uh, acreage of it, where they're located. It's a really helpful presentation that I'm happy to provide. You um, shared that with all of us or not? Did I share that with, I might have I just shared it with our committee, within committee. our committee, okay. but I'm happy to share it more widely. It, it's got a lot of great information. So to the extent we have, don't have to reinvent the wheel here, I think that's helpful. Um, I think we'll still need a consultant though, if we narrow those options down, if we start there or we go further to tell us then what can, what can we build not as a police station, but as a, as a affordable housing complex in that acreage, but it's a very helpful starting place I've, I've found. Um, so I'll make sure to circulate that. Thank you. 
Okay. Anybody else? We covered uh, number eight with me announcing it. Affordable housing committee's communication strategy done. Um, Bob, anybody, would anybody like to uh, public comments? Okay. I got called into a work meeting, but I, I prepared this time. So. <laughs> okay. I, I said I'd be back in the Do you want to, uh, Bob, is this ideal or here? Speak. Oh, here we are. Sure. Oh, okay. Green light. Hey, uh, I'm supposed to introduce myself. Yeah, name uh, and address, please. Sasha Dimitris, uh, 48 Summer Street. Um, last time I was here, I introduced myself and was reminded of the point of the meeting. So I'm going right, to get right to it. Um, we want to reach a moratorium, but we don't want it to be at the detriment to the town. Thankfully for us, um, Ever since post-World War II expansion in the United States, academics have been studying this problem and we have over seven decades of research. And also thankfully for us, most of this research is pretty definitive and it all points into a similar direction. And uh, the man who's sitting there, whose name I totally forget, um, <laughs> uh, mentioned this. Uh, and whether it's being studied from epidemiology or the sustainability of utilities and infra infrastructure, the fiscal well being of the town, conservation of wildlife, success of local businesses. The type of mixed use developments that he was describing is across the board pretty much shown to have the best long term benefits for the town. Um, this is something that we've done a few places 16 Cross Street, 88 Main Street, 42 Forest Street. That's just sort of where I notice on my way here. but. Um, there might be other opportunities within the town, um, but based on the research that's sort of been done across the country for almost 80 years now, that sort of development does have the best long-term outcomes for towns, whether it be people, municipalities, infrastructure, et cetera. But I already know the first protest is going to be, Sasha, we can't do that. That would kill the spirit of the downtown New Canaan area. And my response to that would be that could be true, but it also sort of comes with a not complete understanding of architecture. Um, in architecture, there's a thing called sense of place, and it refers to uh, how memorable a place is and the experiences that you have there and your willingness to return. And we all know downtown New Canaan has a very strong sense of place. We want to maintain that. But it's not some ethereal concept that, you know, happens by accident that just pops up in places. There's demonstrable things that contribute to sense of place, and we should understand those because we want to maintain them and grow them, not accidentally get rid of them with an affordable housing project. Um, you know, it's, it's not that simple, but uh, the first aspect that really contributes to sense of place is accessibility of experiences. So that's safe sidewalks, uh, safe intersections, <laughs> storefronts that are accessible to people that are walking, uh, these all contribute. The next is a cohesive aesthetic. Um, it turns out building material is actually the most important more than architectural style or building height, but those two also play uh, effect. Uh, and then the last is the scale or aspect ratio of the space that you don't want big open spaces like a Walmart parking lot. Ideally, it's something around three to one. So the buildings on the sides that make the walls are um, about a third as high or more as the width of the street. Um, Elm Street is a great example of that as a great aspect ratio. It feels like you're in a place, not a sort of open prairie. Um, so these architectural guidelines can be put in place as they're mentioned, the zoning laws to create multi-use spaces can uh, incorporate that. And uh, as long as we're not creating open spaces, we're not getting rid of sidewalks, we're not getting rid of storefronts, and we're creating it in an architectural style that makes sense in the space. Um, I think this makes a lot of sense. And I don't know if these alone would get us to the moratorium or whatever our goal is, but if these aren't sort of at the front of the options list when we're looking, do we want one big development? Do we want to rezone multiple areas? Like, If we're not considering this, I don't think we're really 
doing what's been shown to be the best solution for towns that are facing this issue. And sorry, I'm out of breath. I, I literally just rode my bike back here from my house. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm Direct. two minutes away, no. but uh, yeah. Thank yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay, motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay, everybody have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Chris. Sleep in tomorrow. <laughs> yeah.